test, 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 test. Test, test, 16th floor, test. Test, test, 16th floor, mic check, test. All right. Good morning, everybody. I am Costa Constantinidis, chair of the Committee on Environmental Protection, and today the committee will hear a package of green roof and renewable energy bills. Um, just some housekeeping up front before I read my statement. If you really like something here in the City Council, we do this. There's no booing if you don't like something. <laughs> and uh, we need to vacate this room by 1 o'clock. So I am going to put, after we have the administration panel, I am going to put everyone on a three-minute timer. If you, if you have testimony that's going to go longer than three minutes, I can't accommodate that, but I can accommodate your written testimony that we will read, take into consideration, and absolutely you know, incorporate into the stuff that we're doing. So I appreciate all of your time here and your, your advocacy, but we do need to have, be out of this room by 1 o'clock, so I do have to put everyone on a three-minute timer, so I apologize for that. Uh, so back, back to our regularly scheduled program. As land continues to be replaced with impervious services due to population growth and urbanization, the necessity to recover green space is becoming increasingly critical to maintain environmental quality. While we need to maintain and grow our green spaces at ground level, installing green roofs is one option that can reduce the negative impact of development while providing numerous environmental, economic, and social benefits. Green roofs can improve stormwater management by reducing runoff and improving water quality. Green roofs can conserve energy, mitigate the urban heat island, and increase longevity of roof membranes. Green roofs can reduce noise and air pollution. Green roofs can also increase bio urban biodiversity by providing habitat for wildlife, space for urban agriculture, and a more aesthetically pleasing and healthy environment where we work, live, and play. Green roofs improve the return on investment compared to traditional roofs. And finally, most importantly, green roofs reduce greenhouse gas emissions by reducing cooling loads, thereby requiring less combustion of fossil fuels associated with HVAC equipment. Today's hearing involves a package of green roofs and renewable energy bills, including Intro six, uh, 961, extending J51 benefits to owners of multiple dwellings for green roofs, Intro 141, requiring the roofs of city-owned buildings be partially covered with source control materials. Intro 276, requiring that roofs with cer of certain new buildings be partially covered in plants or solar panels. Intro 1031, requiring the posting of information regarding green roofs on the website of the Office of Alternative Energy. Intro 1032, requiring the roofs of certain buildings to be covered in green roofs, solar panels, or small wind turbines. Intro 13. Uh, 17 in relation to large wind turbines and a pre-considered intro in relation to studying the feasibility of implementing solar ready measures on commercial buildings. We are also hearing resolution uh, 66 calling on the state legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that would increase real property, property abatement for the installation of a green roof. 
We want these green roofs and other renewable energy technologies installed in New York City to be a model for other places that share our climate characteristics. We need green roofs and other renewable energy technology to reduce our greenhouse gas contributions and help us reach our mandate of reducing 80 by 50. We need to use every hour in our quiver to reach that mandate. Now I want to uh, turn it over to Councilmember uh, Rafael Espinal of Brooklyn, and he'll give an opening statement of his legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm truly um, grateful to be here today talking about green roofs and for your leadership uh, on this issue and holding this hearing. Uh, over 70 percent of global emissions come from cities because we consume more energy and produce more waste. We are ranked in the top 25 cities in the country with the worst air pollution. We have to take these statistics seriously and hold ourselves accountable for what we are doing to our planet. Denver, San Francisco, Toronto, and cities across the country and the world have already stepped up with progressive green roof legislation, meaning we are behind. Today is a significant step forward in bringing New York into the modern age of sustainability. We have 2.6 million square feet of rooftops in the city, and this number is increasing each and every day. This means we have acres of opportunity to reduce our carbon footprint. It would be irresponsible to leave these roofs to bake in the hot sun when we could be harnessing them to cool down our city. Green roofs provide insulation to buildings, reducing energy usage, and even helping with soundproofing. They absorb 90% of stormwater runoff, which is one of the leading causes of water pollution in the city. In addition to saving money on energy bills, green roofs also improve the lifespan of the average roof, leading to fewer repair costs. They clean our air, with studies showing that thousands of kilograms of air pollutants can be captured by green roofs. Expanding green roofs would be a win for our environment, our economy, and our communities. At a time when the Trump administration has turned its back on our planet, it is up to cities like New York to lead the fight against climate change. To do that, we have to adopt policies that take advantage of our unique, untapped assets. So I look forward to hearing from all the advocates and also from the administration on what is the way, best way to move forward, but I truly believe that uh, it is time for New York City to require green, roof, green roofs on all buildings. As I mentioned, all other cities are doing it, uh, and us as being one of the largest cities, uh, it's our time to step up and do right by our city and our planet. Thank you. Thank you, Cast uh, Member Espinal, and I appreciate your leadership as well on these issues. Uh, now for an opening statement on his legislation, uh, Council Member Donovan Richards. Thank you, Costa, and thank you, Samara, and to the rest of the staff and, and my partner Espinal as well on uh, your leadership uh, on these bills. Um, listen, I, I think we need to move to a 100% renewable future in New York City. We are far past where we need to be. And I just want to point to um, not just legislation necessarily, but to the impacts on communities like the Rockaways. Uh, after Hurricane Sandy, uh, I remember many of my residents for months being without electricity. Think about this. Seniors in public housing who could not flush their toilets, charge their phones, uh, communicate with the outside world. Um, because there was no uh, electricity uh, after the storm. We're talking, I got elected in February of 2013. Uh, you're talking nearly five months for these seniors. So this is not rocket science. This is, we should be doing this. Seventy percent of all building emissions, uh, 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 um, uh, carbon emissions come from buildings. It is We are far past uh, the time where we need to move to a renewable future. I'll also talk about the affordability benefits. Uh, we've done some of this in the Rockaways already. I've already told any developer who's coming into the Rockaways who wants to develop that they have to do solar. It's not a choice. It is mandatory. Um, and, um, and I could tell you, I mean, we have residents who are probably paying like $3 in electricity a year because we've done this. So the, the benefits for affordability, keeping our seniors in their homes, keeping uh, housing affordable for our residents uh, is detrimental in this day and age where gentrification is popping up all over the city as well. I also 
talk about the air quality benefits. Obviously, we know, especially for environmental justice communities, black and brown communities who bear the biggest brunt of pollution and uh, the crisis of around affordability and energy, going back to that again, uh, that these bills are a, step, a major step in the right direction. So I'm hoping that the administration is going to support these bills. Uh, and we look forward to hearing from our advocates who have been great uh, on this issue. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I look forward to hearing their testimony. Thank you, Councilmember Richards. Uh, all right, seeing no other colleagues to recognize, we'll now hear testimony from the administration. If our uh, attorney, Samara Swanson, can swear the panel in. Thank you. Can you please raise your right hand? You swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. Yes. Okay. Good morning. My name is Suzanne DeRoche, and I am the Deputy Director for Infrastructure and Energy at both the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I am joined here today by Melissa Enoch, Project Manager, Program Manager for Private Incentives at the Department of Environmental Protection's Bureau of Environmental Planning and Analysis, and Alan Price, Director of the Office of Technical Certification and Research at the Department of Buildings. I want to thank Chairperson Constantinides and the members of the committee for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the de Blasio administration on a package of bills related to green roofs and other sustainable rooftop systems. New York, City, New York City's rooftops are an underutilized resource in an effort to reduce carbon emissions, manage stormwater runoff, and make our city the most sustainable big city in the world. Building rooftops have far more to contribute than a great vantage point to an iconic skyline. With the right incentives for building owners, rooftops can play a role in generating renewable energy, improving the quality of New York City's surrounding waterways, and increasing the resiliency to stronger rain, storms, and heat, while contributing and enhancing the quality of life within our neighborhoods. The administration supports leveraging the city's abundant roof space to maximize sustainability and resiliency with easy and flexible compliance mechanisms for developers and building owners. At present, there are three primary city-supported options for building owners to make improvements that offer environmental and economic benefits. Green roofs. Over the past decade, green or vegetated roofs have become more common in the city. In addition to the stormwater benefits discussed below, green roofs reduce rooftop temperatures and promote energy efficiency and comfort within buildings and can be installed along with solar installations. As of 2016, the Nature Conservancy estimates that there were over 1,200 vegetated roofs covering about 60 acres across the city, a small portion of the total 40,000 acres of citywide <coughs> rooftops. Green roofs are one example of green infrastructure, which DEP builds to improve the quality of the city's waterways. The city's ultra-urban landscape is mostly impervious and can't absorb stormwater, so rain must flow from streets and rooftops into the sewer system. The city has invested billions of dollars in large infrastructure projects and other programs to reduce combined sewer overflow, or CSO, a mix of stormwater and untreated wastewater from entering our waterways. DEP's $1.5 billion green infrastructure program supports projects such as green roofs, rain gardens, and permeable pavements to reduce CSOs and promote the health of the harbor. Today, our waterways are the cleanest in a century. Part of DEP's nationally recognized green infrastructure program is the grant program for private properties. Since the program began in 2011, it has funded 32 projects around the city, with green roofs comprising 60% of them. However, green roofs are expensive to install, not suitable for all buildings, and have less impacts in areas without combined sewer systems or substantial heat vulnerability. To encourage uptake, DEP routinely works with the local green roof industry, holding forums and conducting surveys to fine-tune DEP's program. As a result, DEP established new procedures to fast-track green roof applications, which are now accepted on a rolling basis year-round. DEP has the highest green roof incentive in the nation at $30 per square foot. Solar. 
Solar installations have increased nearly sevenfold since, de Blas since Mayor de Blasio took office, providing more than 170 megawatts of electrical capacity, cutting carbon emissions by 36,000 tons each year, and supporting over 4,000 jobs in the, across the five boroughs. The cost of solar has decreased over 25 percent since 2013. Lower costs, paired with some of the highest electricity prices in the nation, continue to make solar an attractive option, with property, often, property owners often recouping their investment within years. Solar can be paired with either green roofs or cool roofs, both of which can actually increase the amount of electricity produced by a solar installation and maximize the sustainability, resiliency, and financial benefits. The city is also using public buildings to rapidly expand solar deploy deployment. Mayor de Blasio committed to installing 100 megawatts of solar at city-owned and operated facilities by 2025. Today, the city has nearly 11 megawatts of solar PV installed on public buildings, a tenfold increase in just five years, and an additional 30 megawatts is currently being developed or planned. In addition, New York State introduced community shared solar, which enables renters and others who are unable to install their own systems to access the benefits of solar. NYCHA and EDC have up to 300 new community shared solar systems in the pipeline, and that will serve thousands of low and moderate income households. Cool Roofs. As part of Cool Neighborhoods NYC, the city's comprehensive resiliency program designed to keep New Yorkers safe during extreme heat. The administration has pri prioritized the New York City NYC Cool Roofs program in the heat vulnerability, vulnerable areas of the South Bronx, Central Brooklyn, and Northern Manhattan to conduct strategic outreach to owners over the current years. The successful program provides job seekers with training and work experience to install reflective rooftops. Cool solar, cool roofs <laughs> reduces roof temperature, cutting, helping to cut carbon emissions by transferring less heat into the buildings, which in turn helps to reduce carbon consu energy consumption and wasted heat from air conditioning. In addition, cool roofs extend the lifespan of rooftops and HVAC equipment, contribute to the thermal comfort of building residents, and when clustered, can provide a cooling effect to surrounding areas. NYC Cool Roofs offers cool roof installations at no cost or low cost to affordable housing, nonprofits, hospitals, and community centers. To date, almost 10 million square feet of rooftop have been painted. In sum, requiring that new construction incorporate a combination of sustainable rooftop solutions, as described, would help developers install cool roofs and solar or green roofs where it makes most financial and logistical sense. Moreover, adding these features to a building before it is construction, constructed can ensure that the structures are built into the design of the property. Today's introductory bills align with administration climate goals, so we are pleased to testify in general support of them. Introductions 141, 276, and 1032. The administration supports efforts to expand green and blue roofs, cool roofs, solar systems, or a combination thereof on commercial and, and resi residential buildings. We support limiting these efforts to new construction since at this stage, buildings can be designed more effectively to accommodate the heavy structural loads that accompany these systems. We recommend that all new buildings incorporate cool roof surfaces regardless of roof type and green roof or solar photovoltaic generating systems or both. Property owners should have the flexibility to choose climate positive roofing solutions that most suit the building, while including green roof and cool roofing elements. We look forward to working with the council to structure these bills in a way that is cost effective for new development, including affordable housing. Introduction 961. In principle, the administration supports efforts to encourage green roof construction on existing multifamily buildings. However, the J51 state enabling legislation allows local legislative bodies to adopt or amend J51 laws until January 1, 2019, and we respectfully encourage the council to defer passage of any local law that involve the program until it is reauthorized as anticipated in this state legislative session. Introduction 1031. The administration supports efforts to educate community stakeholders about the benefits of green roofs. We look forward to working with the council and the Department of Buildings to ensure that such resources are readily available. 
Introduction 1317. This bill would codify design and construction standards for large wind turbines. We thank the Council for its partnership on Local Law 105 of 2018, which codified design and construction standards for small wind turbines. We look forward to working with Council to ensure that the standards being proposed in this bill ensure the safe installation and acoustic performance of large wind turbines. Conclusion. In conclusion, I would like to thank this committee for its partnership on combating the effects of climate change to New York City. We support the bills that require green roofs. We support bills that require green roofs and solar systems on new construction while providing strong incentives for building owners to retrofit their roofs where possible. Working together, we are confident we can strengthen these bills to help us achieve our carbon reduction goals by better utilizing roof space across the city. I thank you for the, test, the opportunity to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Great. Um, well. Usually when I'm told yes, I, I, I know when to be quiet. <laughs> but I'll, I'll ask a few questions, sure. uh, and then I'll, I'll give it over to my colleagues who I know have questions this morning as well. Um, so looking at you know, some of the, the large wind turbines, um, what do you feel the biggest impediment has been to their implementation? So I know that the SIMS plan, it took you know, four years for them to get permitted. What has been sort of the biggest sort of tripping points for us in implementing wind uh, turbines in the city of New York? With the SIMS project, uh, we did have some challenges uh, looking at large wind turbines. Uh, primarily those challenges were that uh, this was the first project that we looked at for a large wind turbine. So we had to develop criteria, understand the technology, research the industry, uh, and it did take about a year for us to approve that particular project. Mm -hmm. uh, moving forward though, we do have uh, that information from our first initial project that we can rely on and we would expect that uh, any material, uh, any proposal for a new large wind turbine uh, would receive material acceptance in a much quicker time fashion. And so now that we, now that we've figured it out, now that we've, we've come up with the formula, we know how to apply that for everyone else so we can just keep moving forward. That's right. Yes. Uh, that's, that's good to hear. Because uh, I think one of the biggest challenges, and I've said this at these hearings before, is that if we can make it as easy to be green as it is to be traditional, because right now everyone knows that they go to the, you know, the DOB, they get these things done, they're able to get their boiler. We want it to be as simple to be green. And if they're able to do that, then uh, you know, people who are doing these renovations in their buildings, it's not just about dollars, it's about time. It's about ease of navigating through the system. If we can make it just as easy. It, it will be a big boon um, to encourage renewable energy as a, as a real choice. Um, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I'll turn that over to uh, my colleagues. I know Rafael Espinal and, and both Donovan Richards and uh, Rafael so will have questions. I'll begin with Councilmember Espinal. Uh, thank you. Um, again, I, I also don't have many questions hearing that you are in support of these bills. So just for the record, you, you support a requirement for uh, some uh, some storm some sort of green roof on on buildings in New York City. So what what our testimony um, is uh, saying is that we do support sustainable rooftop solutions, right? So we're looking for all the tools that a building owner can use to help us combat climate change, right? That can be solar, that can be green roofs, that needs to be cool roofs as a sort of underlying layer to all of that so we can make sure that we are, um, as you mentioned earlier, our air quality goals are uh, quite important and as we can make our buildings cooler, that helps the urban heat island in New York City. So we are specific in the, in the testimony that we support um, all these sustainable rooftop solutions, in particular in new construction. So you su you support the requirement of one of these one of these solutions on rooftops. So again, we we want to make the buildings as sustainable as possible. We recognize that rooftops are the. I, I support a requirement, so I'm wondering understood. if the administration supports understood. a requirement. That's so what the we bill. We support requirements for new construction. Okay. 
across all of the tools, right? And so we look forward to working with you on how the bills can support what is the tool that's best for each individual building. All right, so I also support um, implementing this bill retroactively uh, on bills that are going to do intensive uh, roof repair, right? Meaning if you're gonna spend the money to redo your entire roof, then you should uh, tr comply to, to one of these methods. Mm -hmm. it, uh, is there a position for the administration on, on that effort? So again, we would have to go back and look at exactly what that definition is. You know, one of our concerns is the structural capacity of the building to support the weight. So we we'll look forward to working with you on what that definition is. Okay. Yeah, and just to be clear, it's again, it's just a requirement on on retroactive on on retrofits um, for folks who are going to do intensive roof repair. You know, we're not sure. we're not saying that starting tomorrow after this bill passes, everyone has to put in put in one of these sustainable roofs. But more of like if you're going to spend the money on redoing your entire roof, then you would be required to do this. Right. And again, we'll look forward to working with you on that definition. All right. Looking forward to hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Camper Espinal. Uh, just really quickly about um, city-owned buildings. Uh, I know that pursuant to a, a previous local law, see, I, I remember the bill numbers. I get lost on the whole local law things. Um, but there was a report issued uh, about the solar readiness of city-owned buildings. Um, what is our plan looking, so there, there's sort of two buckets, right? Those that are solar ready that we're in doing the implementation and those that are not solar ready for their roofs being too old or, you know, that's, it's not just a good spot for solar. How are we uh, getting those buildings that are not currently solar ready because of the age of their roof? How are we doing on roof repairs of these city owned buildings to be able to get them solar ready into the future? So um, again, thank you for that question. I have some general information on how uh, DCAS's solar program is going, um, but they are they are here. So I'm gonna actually call Steve Caputo to talk about the solar uh, ready program. And we're doing some really good stuff in in, in my district in particular with DCAS, and I'm I, I'm grateful for that. But I just want to hear like how we're looking at these buildings that are currently not solar ready because their roofs are too old, how are we getting those roofs up to speed so then we can implement solar or, or green roofs? Sure. Can you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? I do. Uh, well, thank you for having me. For, for the record, my name is Stephen Caputo, I'm Assistant Commissioner at DCAS, uh, Division of Energy Management, uh, where part of the portfolio that I oversee is the clean energy portfolio. So, mm -hmm. um, and thank you for your question. Uh, to date, we've assessed over 100. So in addition to, you know, we've got 10 and a half megawatts in the ground, we have 30 megawatts in development. Mm -hmm. We've assessed over 100 additional uh, buildings, including ones in your district, mm -hmm. which is what, why we were poised to be able to uh, develop those sites. And we're also, so that's like on the assessment side, on project delivery, we're, we're uh, developing new project delivery mechanisms, including uh, contracts uh, that we can use on our own to develop city capital projects and also third party uh, partnerships, uh, some of which have already been uh, you know, discussed before this committee. So, how, but Steve, looking at, uh, there are two buckets, right? Mm -hmm. So that there's those buildings that solar would never work yep. because there's another building towering over it that there's no sunlight. And then there's buildings that are just because their roof is over age 15, they're automatically disqualified from yep. solar readiness. What are we doing as a city to invest those dollars to get those buildings solar ready? Do we have a program? Do we have sort of a, a hierarchy of how do we sort of bring those buildings into compliance, you know, get those roofs sure. fixed, which is good structurally for those buildings because you have buildings that are too old, you know, their roofs are too old, those are no whole different set of problems. Yeah. But once they're renewed, then they can take reasonable renewable energy. How do we do that? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. I want to say there's a lot of things we're doing, but I'll, I'll mention two mm -hmm. I think are, are going to really add value and, and, and capacity. And we're also truly breaking down that dichotomy between solar and not solar ready. So if, it, okay. if the building's not solar ready, we're going to get it to be solar ready in a much more proactive way. So the, the two things that we're doing, one is we're working much more closely with agencies to uh, 
identify roofs that have a lot of potential but are in that zone of needing a roof repair and looking about how we can uh, potentially use some supplemental funding to get them over the hump. And we're, we're doing that with the Department of Sanitation, working closely with DDC. You'll be hearing about those projects uh, soon. The, the second thing is we're incorporating roof repairs into our project delivery mechanism. So both with the New York Power Authority, um, we have a pre-qualified list of contractors that can do roof repairs. So we're starting to see the roof repair piece a replacement as integral to the work and, and are even willing to sh co-share funding for that with the agencies. Because I mean, I'm, I look at certain buildings, like in, in, I'll give an example in my community, there's a, a building PS2, mm -hmm. that it's the largest building in the neighborhood and it, it will forever be the largest building in that neighborhood because it's right next to LaGuardia Airport. Yeah. So no one's ever gonna be able to build higher. So that is a prime category for Lots of uh, different renewable energy rooftops, yep. but the the building the roof is over 15 years old, and mm -hmm. and I think in those pro op those are that's a real opportunity that I feel we can work together on to to get there. I just wondering how we're pro I know that Donovan has mm -hmm. buildings near JFK Airport mm -hmm. that probably fit that same criteria, and I, we can go on and on. So how do we? Yeah. Like find those spots that we know that forever they're going to be good solar spots. Let, let's how do we how do we get there? Yeah, without commenting on the specifics of that site, which I'm I'm just using as an example. Do. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I always like I to tell stories. We we <laughs> couldn't agree more that in order to reach this hundred megawatt goal, uh, we have to do exactly what you're saying. Like it's it, we we can't we can't hit that goal if we just follow the regular roof replacement cycle, particularly for these great opportunities. So, and I, I've been on only for nine months. We have a, a new team that's. People are joining one last week, another next week, who have solar and rooftop ex roofing experience. So we're really poised to make the transition that you're speaking to. Great, thank you, thank you. And I, I have one more question for DEP. So um, before I'm done, I'm going to hand it over to you in a second. Um, how are we, as we are making repairs at D DEP facilities? How are we incorporating uh, uh, th you know, these types of renewable projects? In baking those into the cake, rather than are we are we separating them out and saying, um, you know, first we're going to do these repairs and then we're going to do renewables, or are we are we considering these as part and parcel with one another? Hi, good morning. Morning. Um, I, I, we swore sorry. you in already. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> no. Do you swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? Yes. Um, good morning. My name is Mikkel Adgate. I'm with the Bureau of Public Affairs at DEP. Um, to your question about sort of energy <coughs> upgrades at DEP facilities, um, we do have an office of energy um, and a growing team that are looking at our existing um, portfolio of buildings and opportunities. Um, I would say it's very case by case in terms of our facilities. As you know, DEP has a, a very um, wide portfolio, different types of facilities, each requiring different needs and assessments. But that office is really looking at each of them in terms of what their sort of day-to-day -day operations are and what the opportunities are. Because, I mean, I look at some of the projects that are coming down the pike and, and I see projects that are going to take us till 2024, 2025 to complete. Mm -hmm. And looking at those projects, if we don't build sustainability into them, means we have to wait until 2025, even to start implementation, right. which doesn't make any sense to me. If we can, if we can do both and, and make them simultaneous when they're when, that, when we're working on those roofs anyway, mm -hmm. I think that's an opportunity for us. Yes, and, and we completely agree with you. So in addition to the work that our Office of Energy does, within our Bureau of Engineering and Design and Construction, we have a sustainability group that works very closely with the design engineers as they're working on facility plans and designs for new facilities, but also retrofits to our existing facilities. Um, we use sort of the latest technology and planning tools, including in vision which helps us to assess that development at the planning stage so that we can incorporate not just the designs but we can be sort of um, aware of the costs and those impacts on the planning but 
by and large, we're looking at every single project that's in the pike in terms of what can we do to be more sustainable and align with the larger energy goals of the agency. Okay. All right, so this time I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Donovan Richards, for questions. Uh, just some quick questions, Chair. Uh, you want to, oh, I guess you'll do, go ahead. You want to acknowledge him? Oh. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we have uh, Council Member uh, Kalman Yeager from Brooklyn here. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you, Chair. Um, can you speak to how many um, rooftops citywide uh, um, have had green roof systems installed? So we don't have a citywide uh, database of green roof projects implemented um, across the city. DEP tracks projects we've funded and projects that we learn about um, in our green infrastructure program asset management tracking system, and those are available on our uh, public map. So for example, we track all the projects we fund through our grant program, and any green roofs we implement as part of our public property retrofit program, um, as well as all the projects that went through DOB's tax abatement program, mm -hmm and some other large-scale green roof projects that we uh, have heard about throughout. So the you wouldn't be able to give us a, a number? No. The, the we had some numbers in our testimony about the nature yeah, conservancy. Yeah, so the nature conservancy, my understanding, um, and maybe they're in the room and are going to testify, um, is looking to build a tool, an online tool. Um, but in the uh, latest numbers that we had, which are in the testimony, were about uh, 1,600 installations uh, as of 2016, and that was from the Nature Conservancy. All righty, so forewarning, that may be a bill idea uh, moving forward. Um, can you I just want to say that we would support that. Okay. <laughs> so tracking Jordan, my legislative director, is here. He's putting it in right now. Um, <laughs> all righty. Um, so I do want to circle back to something um, many of my colleagues spoke about, and I think, you know, obviously doing new roofs are much easier because it's new construction. Um, I wanted to go back to your, or your reservations and, 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 and retroactively looking at um, buildings, and if, and if they are, I mean, how are you, are, are there capital programs available? What, how much money are, are within these capital programs um, that would enable uh, old buildings who primarily, I mean, we have a lot of buildings in New York City, um, you know, I'm sure burning dirty oil. Um, how do we how do we get to a point where we are looking to address those buildings as well? Don't be shy. Sure. So um, DEP is funding green roofs as part of its larger green infrastructure program that was mentioned in the testimony. Um, so we have a $1.5 billion program to implement stormwater source controls and combined sewer areas of the city to reduce combined sewer overflows. And green roofs are a very important piece of that program because this is New York City. It's an ultra urban environment and rooftops are good space for us to work in. We primarily work on, so when I'm, when I'm thinking about public buildings, um, we work with parks, public housing, and schools to implement cost-effective green infrastructure where we can find that opportunity. Oftentimes that happens at a site level because that those parts of the properties allow us for high volume capture stormwater projects that are much more cost effective than green roofs. That being said, green roofs are a part of the tool that we have available and some agencies want to pursue those. So we have a funding request in place now to do over 300,000 square feet of green roofs with the Parks Department and we're really excited. City owned buildings. City owned. Okay. City -owned. I'm, I want to focus on private Private, buildings. okay. Private. So are there any programs for private? Right. Animals? So <laughs> DEP implements a green infrastructure grant program that is primarily a retrofit program. How much money in that particular program? Well, we've committed about 15 million, almost 15 million dollars to date. Um, we, you know, it's when in 2011 it started with three million, and we've more than quadrupled mm -hmm. it since then. So, it's part of our larger green infrastructure capital budget. Um, those are primarily retrofits because the program design review lines up better with retrofits than it does with new construction. Um, we 
typically spend a lot of time working with a private property owner to determine if their project is the right fit before they submit. And a lot of that includes them undertaking a structural analysis, reviewing all the existing planning documents to see if the building has structural capacity. And how many buildings have taken advantage, uh, I mean, uh, landlord owners have taken advantage of this and how much money has been spent out of that 15 million you said? Yeah, so 32 projects. So 32 projects. And, and about 14 million has been committed to them. So 14 million committed, but how much yeah. has been spent? Well, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, we can get back to you on that. Mm -hmm. There, uh, Of the 32, I would say a little over 25 have been actually constructed, and all of those funds have been spent out to date. So the average award is about $480,000, And that's 25 projects since 2011, or it's, can you give it's me It's 32 projects. Oh, constructed? Yes. Uh, about 25 since 2011. So could we do better? We can, yeah, okay. we can do that, better. That's a, a minuscule number, you know, 25. We're, My we're, son wasn't even born in 2011. <laughs> um, so how could we ensure that building owners know that this program exists? What has sure. been, are there barriers? I'm just trying to understand why sure. it's only 32 sure. projects a, over the course of eight yeah. years now. Uh, yes, yeah, seven. <laughs> seven full years of the program. Seven. So okay. we um, have made a lot of improvements over the years. So we took the program citywide last year. So we used to just be limited to the combined sewer area, but we see green roofs as an important tool to meeting our other water quality objectives in separately sewered areas of the city too. So now we're citywide. We accept applications on a rolling basis, which we think helps people with their project timelines. We uh, released a, a green roof funding schedule last year to give a specific dollar amount that DEP has available for green roof projects based on soil depth and project size. We feel like that has reduced a lot of the uncertainty and people can plan with their project teams when they come in the door and see exactly how much funding is available. We even uh, streamlined some of the insurance requirements. So I just wanna uh, let everybody know that this is a capitally funded program and there are limitations to spending those funds on private properties and some there are some impediments and we've been working really hard with the law department and OMB to make sure that we can make it as streamlined as possible all right so I would love to hear just on a side note how we can be helpful in ensuring all the different agencies OMB right. the bean counters yeah. who I know probably are a big impediment to certain projects moving forward. Um, so I, I'm interested, I'm sure the committee will, will explore that. Um, last, I just wanted to, to hit on, how are you working with HPD specifically? So there are buildings that, where their Article 11 needs to be to come up, uh, comes up again perhaps at the council. How are you working with HPD um, through old construction, especially when uh, landlords come to us and they wanna renew their, their Article 11s, tax abatements? Um, is there a process uh, with HPD to um, incorporate green energy um, as uh, buildings come up? That means no. Okay. Well, okay. Sorry. No, no. I asked him a different question. Okay. Um, so, you know, well, there's a lot of coordination across agencies, both on the solar side as well as um, we haven't talked a lot about the Cool Roofs program, which mm -hmm. is something that you know we're really excited about and think is a very low cost, easy way to retrofit a building. So um, anyone that's not familiar with it, we're happy to provide more information about how it can be done at, at low cost. Um, so uh, my under and we we need to get back to you specifically on HPD and the Green mm -hmm. Roof program, but but I know that a lot of coordination happens on uh, the solar side uh, and cool roofs in particular. Okay, so we look forward to hearing a little bit more about that. Right. Thank you for the work that you are doing though. Of course, I have. we have to push you. I still do think 32 projects is not, um, in my opinion, I can't speak for anyone else, showing a real serious commitment to um, green and roofs. So I, I would hope that we're gonna push much harder um, especially if we're going to reach that 80 by 50 goal that we set. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Richards. Uh, Councilmember Espinal has another question. 
Thank you. Uh, going back to um, uh, the, the green roof program, um, what's the minimum square footage you need to in order to be able to qualify for it? There's a 3,500 square foot minimum. Is there a reason behind that? Is there any way we can expand that? I, I, I do believe there'll be a lot of homeowners uh, with townhouses especially who would be interested in greening their rooftops and taking advantage of a program like that. Sure. So um, right now it's dictated by the capital funding minimum of $35,000. So if you look at um, the new incentive schedule we set out where we identified sort of the cost effective dollar per square foot available for private property owners, 35000 is the minimum. So it's based on a one inch um, soil, one and a half inch soil depth of roof at uh, $10 a square foot. So that the math works out that it's 3,500 square feet. That's for one inch. What if they decided to put in a three inch? Yeah, so the, the funding a schedule outlines sort of the dollar per square foot. So um, any way you look at it, the, the minimum would still be 3,500 square feet. Is there any way where we can change that minimum um, legislatively? Yeah, so um, that brings up a good point. So we submitted a funding request last fall to switch our program from capital to expense. There are restrictions with using capital dollars on private property, and we feel we've taken the program to where we can take it with capital dollars. So moving the program to expense funding would allow us to make some additional streamlining. We would still have a maintenance requirement and you know re restrictions that come along with executing a contract with the city of New York, but we feel like we can make some additional streamlining measures, and, and one of those may be reducing the minimum square footage. Okay. Has has DEP ever thought about maybe creating an incentive uh, that would push uh, homeowners, building owners uh, who have a yard space to turn their asphalt into green spaces? That has been requested often. Um, the way our green infrastructure program works is that we we get credit for impervious area managed. So a straight retrofit of asphalt to just grass wouldn't allow us to meet our regulatory commitments. But that's certainly something that comes up a lot. Um, and I know that there have been some building code revisions to encourage or, or stop that from happening as well. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I thank this panel uh, for your time. Look forward to working with you to get uh, both these bills implemented and uh, to make our city greener and more sustainable. So thank you for the work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, so moving forward, we are going to have everybody on a three-minute clock. I ask you to stay to that three minutes. Again, we will take your testimony, your written testimony, read it, absolutely look to and see if, what we can incorporate. So thank you. Uh, so Alan Burchell, Urban Strong. Uh, Melissa Daniels, Green Roofs uh, for Healthy Cities, Zach Steinbergs from the Real Estate Board of New York, uh, Tim Barrett from GRHC. I hope that's the right, uh, I'm reading that right. Uh, yep, okay. Uh, and Emily Maxwell from the Nature Conservancy. Missing somebody up there? Alan Burchell, Melissa Daniels, Zach Steinberg, Tim Barrett. Tim, come up.
Hello, thank you. Um, Alan has asked that I start so he can get his presentation ready for you guys. So, <laughs> okay, um, my name is Melissa Daniels. I am here representing Green Roofs for Healthy Cities. I want to thank the chairman and the committee for the opportunity to speak today. Um, again, I, I am here representing as a board director of Green Roofs for Healthy Cities, a nonprofit member based association whose mission is to develop the green roof and wall industry throughout North America. My firm, Plant Connection, has worked on hundreds of thousands of square footage of green roof and walls throughout North America for the past 12 years. Most notably, local green roofs at City Field, the Solera and Verdesian buildings in Battery Park, and the 4,000 square foot living wall on Liberty Street across from the World Trade Center 9-11 Memorial. As the impacts of climate change worsen in cities, we need policies like those you have proposed to utilize our roofs and walls for both a reduction in greenhouse gases and to adapt to climate change impacts like those we saw at Superstorm St Sandy. The rapid transformation of the roofs and walls of our cities can make my life much better for the citizens of New York City in the decades to come. Since green roofs provide a wide variety of public and private benefits, we work with policymakers in cities across North America to craft effective policies to grow the green roof market. In the past three years, for example, we have worked with the City of San Francisco on its Better Roofs Ordinance, which requires green roofs and or solar panels on all new buildings. In Portland, Oregon, we work to implement a mandatory green roof requirement on all new buildings as well. In Denver, Colorado, the majority of people in that city voted in a ballot initiative in favor of mandatory <coughs> green roof requirements for both new and existing buildings just last year. Unfortunately, New York has not been out in front with these proposed policies. As a comparison, for example, with the City of Toronto, which is now celebrating 10 years of mandatory green roof requirements and the addition of more than 6 million square feet of green space. The cities of Chicago and Washington, D.C. both have regulations on new development that essentially require green roofs on new buildings, and both cities have implemented millions of square feet over the past decade. While New York City regularly sits among the top 10 North American municipalities for installed green squ roof square footage, Further investigation of these values finds that compared to other cities in that ranking, New York falls quite low. According to our annual reporting of green roof installation, while ranking sixth in overall installed square footage, green roofs in New York City green roof square footage per capita and per metropolitan area in square footage sits well below other cities in the top 10. Across the last 10 years of reporting, New York City's installed square footage of green roof represents about 77.4 square feet of green roof per square mile of city area and 0.12 square feet per capita. For comparison, Chicago, ranked only one place higher than New York, saw green roof installations at 125.7 square feet per square mile and 0.5 square feet per capita over the same period. New York City has an unprecedented opportunity to seize on the myriad benefits of these technologies both for the public and private bottom lines as well as for the environment and has the unique potential to become the green leader in the United States and North America with policies to support it. One of the amazing things about green roof technology... If you could, if you could please wrap up. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, I'll skip it. Other organizations can testify to the many public green roof benefits such as reduction in the urban heat island effect and superior stormwater management. However, one of the important benefits of green roof policy is its ability to generate new employment opportunities in New York City. In essence, green roofs cannot be imported from China or Mexico and, have, and by their nature create truly sustainable local job opportunities. Some of these employment opportunities are well suited to marginalized populations within urban areas and can contribute to greater social justice. One year of employment in the green roof industry is generated from forty-five to $65,000 in investment because green roofs are labor intensive. Our analysis of the Denver Green Roof Initiative indicated that over a 15 year period of time, mandatory green roofs on new and existing buildings would have generated 25,000 job years of employment. This analysis includes an assumption of 125 acres of roof space for food production. Moreover, green roof projects like Millennium Park in Chicago or the High Line generate increased tourism trade and facilitate additional real estate development and job opportunities. New York is poised to grow significantly with the passage of new supportive legislation. There are very few opportunities. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. Okay. I really need you to, to really summarize and wrap up. Okay. Please. Thank you so much. There are very few, pop few opportunities for public policymakers to pass policies that provide a wide range of public benefits simultaneously while providing tangible, bankable private benefits and make use of wasted space in urban areas. 
Green roofs are not a radical idea or policy direction. It's time New York joins other world-class cities and utilizes these wasted spaces to fight climate change and prepare for its impact. Thank you. Thank you. Right, next up. All right. Well, that's a fast three minutes. Um, okay, I'm gonna, it's a real three minutes. It's so. a real three minutes. Okay, I'm going to blast through this. Just know that if anybody wants these slides, they can be. Uh, you just contact me, and I can give them to you. My name is Alan Birchall. I'm the founder and principal of Urban Strong. We offer design, build, maintenance services for green roofs. The vendors that we work with have um, designed hundreds of thousands of square feet of green roofs over the last ten years or so. Um, Here's a snapshot of some of the modern issues facing dense urban centers like New York City. And as we've heard many times today, uh, green roofs combat all of them directly. There's other many more benefits not mentioned here, including the long tail of tax revenue that can come from the maintenance of these green roofs, as well as the skilled job creation uh, that green roofs bring to a city. I like, to, I like to speak in metaphors. Green roofs are like a Swiss army knife in terms of the benefits that they offer. Uh, cities want tools for combating the issues that they're facing, be it urban center issues or climate change issues. Um, this is one, uh, just a high level overview of uh, one reason why the New York City property tax abatement was too low and why I definitely stand for um, raising it to $15. Basically, uh, the upfront requirement to get started with a green roof property tax filing and the surveying to retain an architect and whatnot um, can be five to eight thousand dollars at the low end and if you're only getting back five dollars and twenty three cents per square feet that means the cutoff size is somewhere around a thousand to fifteen hundred square feet uh, just for context a brownstone is about eight hundred square feet with about five hundred square feet plantable area so moving it up to fifteen dollars would get you there because they're going rates about fifteen to thirty dollars in new york city um, I'm going to zero in today on the benefits of integrating green roofs with solar. A lot of people think that these two technologies um, are competitors. They do compete for real rooftop space right now, but that's only because people aren't aware of how they can be integrated together. Um, here's uh, one sample technology. This shows how they can be integrated together physically in the same space. Not only are these, not only can they be physically integrated in the same space, but they actually work together harmoniously and uh, uh, synergistically, they boost each other's performance. A quick overview of how this happened is that plants, um, through uh, the process of phytoremediation, they, they actually sweat through their pores or the stomata in the leaves. This process is called transpiration. This act of sweating um, cools the air around them. This is a snapshot of a spec sheet of a standard solar panel. The brand doesn't matter. It basically shows the temperature performance coefficient. In summary, every solar panel below a certain base case, which is 77 Fahrenheit, for every degree that the ambient air reaches around that solar panel, they lose efficiency. So if you can somehow keep the air around them cooler, you boost the performance of that solar panel in terms of its ability to produce electricity. Um, average rooftops, this was a study done on a Con Ed building, average rooftop temperatures for black roofs can, uh, as of April onwards can hit 150 up to 170 Fahrenheit. That's a full 100 degrees Fahrenheit above the base case study. Green roofs basically uh, reduce the, the temperature ceiling up on those rooftops, keeping them at a maximum of say 90 or 100 Fahrenheit, which can claw back upwards of 15, 20, 22 percent efficiency. Um, and yeah, right. that's, this is just how they all work, how they blend together. It's all in your notes there. Yep. Um, and here's some unique benefits for solar green roofs in the city. That's a real three minutes, eh? That's a real three minutes, brother. <laughs> oh God, did I brief? <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, sh sure. And, and please, everyone stay on the panel so we can ask any questions that are needed. So no one get up. Next. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Zach Steinberg, and I'm the Vice President at the Real Estate Board of New York. As noted in testimony, Rebney submitted to this committee last month, the challenges posed by climate change are profound and merit significant attention. Indeed, that is why we support the Council's efforts to find smart, targeted ways of reducing building energy consumption, and it is also why many of our members have already taken significant steps to improve energy efficiency, cut energy use, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. I will submit full testimony in writing and focus the rest of my comments on intros 276 and 1032. These bills would mandate the installation of solar panels, green roofs, or wind turbines in various degrees on different types of buildings. As drafted, however, the measures fail to recognize that not all rooftops in New York City are appropriate for them. Many buildings in the city do not get adequate sunlight to make solar panels useful to generate energy. And without adequate sunlight, green roofs quickly turn into brown roofs as plants die off. This issue is particularly important given proposed intro number 1253, 
that would require building owners to take steps to reduce building greenhouse gas emissions. As currently drafted, that measure provides building owners with the flexibility to meet the emissions limits through whatever means the building owner determines is most appropriate. This legislation, however, would force building owners to use their resources to install specific systems on their rooftops, even if other investments would do more to help reduce their building's greenhouse gas emissions or reduce energy consumption. The interaction of these bills is notable given concerns that about these measures that they do not provide sufficient guidance on whether they would apply to new construction only or if they would also apply to existing structure under certain circumstances, as we've discussed. Practical factors will also complicate the ability of building owners to comply with this legislation. Specifically, such a requirement would create a conflict with the zoning code. In high-density residential districts, the zoning resolution controls for the provision of open space. This requirement is often fulfilled with the provision of set-aside rooftop space for tenant access and recreation. The bill as drafted would require an open space encroachment that would negate a requirement already adopted by this body. Additionally, building owners currently may reserve rooftop space for uses important to the building and, and safety, including to allow for the safe use of window washing rigs, antennas and broadcast equipment, water tanks, and others. Further, in some buildings, rooftop spaces are actually leased to tenants and therefore not in control of the building owner. This legislation does not sufficiently recognize these potential complications. Finally, key terms in the bills, including rooftop and mechanical equipment, are not defined and should be refined in order to provide more clarity as to what is meant by those terms. As an alternative, given the complexities raised by amending the building code in these ways, Remedy encourages that these issues be more fully considered as part of the Department of Building's ongoing building code revision process. If the Council does choose to move forward with these measures, we would welcome the chance to discuss ways of crafting legislation that achieves our shared goals of reducing building energy consumption, restricting greenhouse gas emissions, and ultimately limiting the harmful effects of climate change. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Next up. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Council members. My name is Tim Barrett. I'm the president of the Barrett Company. We're a uh, system supplier of green roofs. We've been doing this nationally for about 20 years. And I was asked by Green Roofs for Healthy Cities to um, address the issues from our point of view as system suppliers and to speak to uh, some of the issues from our end. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about what quality control safeguards are available and how does that tie into what happens if a green, green roof leaks? We hear that a lot, that what if it leaks? Well, the QC that we're using and, and most of the industry is using is called electric field vector mapping, which in simple terms, a electrical pulsating charge is put into the deck underneath the green roof and the surface is, is wetted down so if there's any void in the waterproofing, any damage, the electricity will flow through the waterproofing and they'll detect it on the top side with the electrical detector and they vector in on the spot where the, um, the defect or the damage is and you have a very simple fix. Uh, so what happens when a roof leaks? It's not a big deal. Um, secondly, what about root damage? Well, we have root barriers that are proven we have standards to, that, that address uh, long-term performance and root damage is no longer an issue. Uh, do grain roofs protect or hurt roofs? Some people will tell you they hurt roofs because they're always moist and they're gonna damage the waterproofing. Well, there's not a lot of truth to that. If a waterproofing material is used, it will protect the environment they're, I don't know how, exactly how to phrase this, but the, the, in a conventional grain roof assembly, the, the membrane is protected by the insulation and the soil and the vegetation. So you've taken away virtually everything that hurts a green roof. Um, the UV, rooftop traffic, and, um, And there's a third one, I can't think of it right now. Um, oh, the, the maintenance people, the plumbers and electricians that are up on the roof and, and tend to damage roofing. So that it's pretty much accepted within, within the industry that a 
protected green roof will last two to three times longer than a conventional roof. When you think about that and the environmental impact on dumps, it's huge. Uh, if a standard roof lasts 17 years and a green roof lasts three times that much, we've reduced 9 million tons going to the dump every year for the extra years that we've saved. If you can begin wrapping up, yes. Okay. Um, it, it goes so fast. I'm, I'm the fourth generation of my family uh, to be in the roofing business, and all types of roofing are net polluters, whether it's the, the hot tar, hot asphalt, uh, PVC, EPDM, uh, the rubber sheets, uh, the PMMAs, they all, between manufacturing, installation, and disposal, they all are net polluters. With green vegetative roofs for the first time, our industry can become a net contributor to the environment. And if that's not enough reason to enact the legislation you're talking about, I don't know what is. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Next up. Hi, good, good morning. Um, my name is Emily Noble Maxwell. I'm the New York City Program Director for the Nature Conservancy in New York, and you heard a little bit about our research. Um, just to briefly tell you about us, we are a global conservation organization, the biggest in the world. We operate in all 50 states and in 70 countries. We also run urban conservation programs in more than 25 cities across the United States. In New York, we have 90,000 members, 35,000 of whom live right here in New York City. Just to give you a little bit about who we are. Um, we also have a very strong legislative team in Albany um, who we collaborate with on all things legislative and policy. So I am here today to express our strong support for the ongoing efforts um, to green and better utilize rooftops across New York City to encourage the committee to advance legislation that will expedite the expansion of green roofs across New York City, especially in the neighborhoods that need them most and to offer our collaboration to advance such efforts at the city and state levels. Many people in this room know that nature and all things green play a crucial role in the life of New York City, and that our rooftops are a largely untapped resource that offer a suite of compelling and multiple benefits to our communities. I won't enumerate these all, but I would like to put this in context that by 2080, we expect that the frequency of heat waves will triple and that we, we will see 1.5 more times um, extreme precipitation events. Green roofs play a critical role in absorbing stormwater and in mitigating extreme heat, so we know that this asset is necessary. Despite the myriad benefits that this asset offers, the Nature Conservancy realized a few years ago that there actually wasn't a clear picture of how our rooftops were being used across the city. And so we endeavored, along with some partners from the Green Roof Research Alliance, to actually answer that question. I'll tell you all that the news is not great, unfortunately, and we can do a lot better. Our research found that as of 2016, of the approximately million buildings in the city, that if you put them together that constitute an entire borough's worth of land, that less than 750 of them have green roofs. That's less than 0.1%. So we know that we can do better, and we applaud you all for, for making that effort. Um, not only is the percentage low, we also found that the majority of those roofs are in Manhattan, particularly downtown Manhattan. So as we think about issues of equity and real need across our city, we know that this asset is not yet reaching the neighborhoods that need it most. What can we do about that? And let me just know, we'd be shared a, pleased to share a more robust you know, findings. With I, you. I would like to see those, please. Yeah, absolutely. We can get that to you. Um, we want to encourage that when looking at the potential option to expand green roofs across the city, let's take a look at where they're most needed. For example, priority watersheds by DEP. We can also look at the heat vulnerability index as designated by the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and open space starved communities and schools. I will stop there because my time is up, but I'm very pleased to be with you today, and we really offer ourselves as an ally and a partner. Uh, I really want to thank all of you. D don't get up yet. I mean, we have a few questions, but I, I want to begin by thanking you all um, for your testimony and your advocacy. Uh, you've raised a lot of really interesting uh, points and questions, and 
uh, look forward to partnering with you, not just on this legislation, um, but on other things we can do as a city, right? Just, just because we pass this legislation today doesn't mean we're done and we can go home and celebrate. There's going to be a lot more work to do. Um, so I definitely uh, would love to see more data and more opportunities to talk about these issues. Um, so I want to recognize my colleague, uh, Councilmember Steve Levin from Brooklyn, um, who also has questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I just want to ask a quick question to this panel. Um, with regard to um, the city, New York City's incentives, uh, tax incentives to build uh, green roofs, um, uh, I'm curious how you see that fitting within the overall kind of spectrum of different uh, cities or municipalities or states um, uh, in terms of their incentives and whether it's sufficient. My understanding is it's $5 a square foot, uh, where if you were to compare that to Washington, D.C., or um, uh, I'm not sure what Philadelphia has, but I think it's better than that. Um, uh, you know, it's 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 not it's not enough to cover the costs or the um, that are associated with a with a, uh, a conversion or a build out. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to that. Anyone on this panel? I can take a, a quick crack at it. So I'm not an expert on the tax incentives that exist in other cities, although we could. Quick, probably quickly find and provide that information for you all if it's of interest. But I think what we can observe is that the $5 um, credit or abatement has been ineffective and that a larger abatement or credit would be beneficial. And I, I can say that I don't know that we know the exact number, but I think the Nature Conservancy would like to see um, a more robust abatement and that there could be consideration given to a tiered abatement structure um, based on needs such as those that I mentioned in my testimony. Okay. Yeah, I would love to kind of see if you're able to do any research just on, on you know, I, I was at a panel a couple of years ago with somebody from Washington where I think they have a $15 um, abatement, and that, um, you know, clearly has different uh, effects. I mean, it, would, it draws more people into uh, the program, and I think that we can afford it, and I think it's beneficial to, um, uh, to our city and to our overall uh, environment, and so I see no reason not to do it. Um, and that's why I have a resolution 66 to call on the state to do that. I would like to add, if I can, that in Washington, besides the $15, they will expedite all the permitting process mm -hmm. so that rather than uh, waiting six months, uh, typically you can get stuff through in two weeks. And for developers, that means money. All right. So we just, I just want to note for the record, we did see a lot of waving fingers in the crowd for that point. And for the record, Chicago in implemented that strategy in their policies, and it did a lot to, to uh, accelerate the, the growth of green roofs in their city. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'd also like to chime in to make sure that when you're doing these comparisons, make sure that you're comparing apples to apples because, okay. uh, you know, $5 per square foot, let's say, if that was the case across the country, uh, you have to understand that New York City can be significantly more expensive to yeah. do this kind of work in when you, when you talk about, you know, cranes and permitting and construction and labor and getting all the materials there on site. So think of it as a percentage of what the typical going rate is uh, to see uh, how helpful these uh, so then, are. so then five dollars is even less uh, impactful uh, yes. in comparison. Yes. Um, yes. The, the other the other city I remember uh, was on this panel was Toronto, where they're uh, they have a I believe a mandate or an alternative kind of contribution to the city, and I think like the vast majority of first for build uh, roofs over a certain size, and I think the vast majority of buildings were actually doing the green roofs as opposed to paying into the fund. Um, so that's another approach, um, is just, uh, you know, m mandating it. Yeah, the, the program there has been very uh, successful. And I would like to just put um, uh, her point in a perspective when she said that only point, was it 0.1% of rooftops? Less than 0.1%. Less than 0.1% of rooftops are green in New York City. By comparison, in Germany, over 20% of flat rooftops have vegetated yeah. rooftops at the moment. That's more than one out of every five buildings right. with a flat roof has a green roof. Right, and frankly, I mean, I'll just say this and I'll turn it back to the chair that, you know, I was on this, I was part of this panel, I think like two or three years ago. We've missed an entire building cycle since that time. Um, and, you know, I represent downtown Brooklyn and Greenpoint and Williamsburg where, you know, I've seen hundreds of buildings go up in the last five years, hundreds of <laughs> go up in the last five years. Um, with all, you know, some of them are more vertical than you know, horizontal, but, um, you know, 
I see hundreds of, I mean, in that I see hundreds of missed opportunities. Um, you know, and so to your point, the delta between 0.1% and 20% um, is, you know, that's a lot of room to grow, but is obviously achievable because we're not, you know, buildings are buildings, whether they're in Germany or New York City. So like, what are we doing wrong and what are they doing right and how can we fix it? I think something that's contributed to it as well is um, in 1968, I believe it was, they overhauled the building code and they concluded that the, the rooftop loading had been over-engineered. And so ironically, the newer buildings that have been built have much uh, weaker rooftop support. Um, one thing I'd like to throw in here is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of potential for developing the rooftops in New York City, but w frankly, we don't know what's available. The, to do the initial engineering survey, the structural survey, to see what's available for rooftops, it can be very cost prohibitive. At the low end, it can be three to five thousand dollars for like a small building. And while it is retroactively reimbursed through the DEP grant program, it's only reimbursed if you wind up going into the DEP grant program. And so mm -hmm. this can be a bit of a barrier to entry. Um, I think it would be in the city's, city's best interest to know what can their buildings. Uh, building stock support on the rooftop. So um, I would like to propose somehow, um, you know, earmarking funds or um, mm -hmm. incentivizing or subsidizing a structural survey of all the rooftops in the city just to know what's up there, what's available. Right. Maybe through the form of a tax abatement. I think that we would be prevented from giving a direct grant um, uh, perhaps, but Re regardless of what direction you go with it, you know, mm -hmm. let's let's see what we have available to work with across the city. There's obviously a public interest involved there. Yeah. So. Okay. It, Thank you. Be it solar, or green roof, or or what else, green or both. Yeah. Or both. Right. Thanks. Like like we see right there. Thank you. One one more point on that is nobody has mentioned the Javits Center, which has a a green roof on it that is uh, extremely lightweight. It was yeah. a retrofit. It's prospering. <laughs> And the management of, of Javits raves about it. Right. So, you know, the weight issue is, is not everything that people are cracking it up to be. Right, right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I agree with your point. Beautiful roof. Um, we have Common Yeager from Brooklyn who wants to ask a few questions. Good morning. If uh, you have a 10 story building surrounded on all sides by 20-story buildings and the sun never hits the top of the roof. Is there any use to putting a green roof there or a solar panel? I would say absolutely yes. Okay. Uh, there are low light requirements for certain vegetation um, that can prosper in that type of environment and you're still absorbing the precipitation that falls on the roof, which is the number one driving force behind the green roof development. I'm, I'm by no means a technical expert on the viability Nor of green I. roofs as, as these folks are, but I think the question we would raise is, does it make sense to mandate it everywhere on all new buildings coming up in the city or potentially for all retrofits or change in occupancy or change in use that would trigger such a requirement in the building code. There are plenty of places where it's just not going to make sense, particularly if you're asking building owners to make economic investments in their properties, such as trading off between, do I have to do a new boiler or do I now have to set aside more money because I'm going to have to figure out how to deal with my re-roofing and my cost just went up because now i got to put a green roof or solar panels on it. So I think it's not quite as straightforward a calculation for a lot of building owners in situations like you're describing. When we build a green roof, we, we strive to recreate the natural environment up on the rooftop. And <clears throat> if you think of a forest, there's plenty of shady forests with plant life growing down underneath the tree canopy. <clears throat> uh, to this gentleman's point here, uh, there are plenty of plant species that are shade tolerant and actually require the shade. And so um, it is entirely possible to build a green roof in a mostly shady area. Um, the, there's been advancements in the world of solar, rooftop solar, in terms of micro-inverters that allow for portions of shade to fall on the solar array and not impact the other panels. But if the entire, if no sunlight ever hits that rooftop, no, there's no point, in my opinion, of putting a solar PV electric array up there. But a rooftop, a green rooftop, yes, there still is a point. Okay, and if somebody puts a green rooftop up, it obviously involves uh, caretaking and Mm -hmm. uh, lawn mowing and things of that nature. If somebody, whatever. Oh, fair question. Going Continue. Up there. So go ahead. Yeah. If you have uh, 
uh, a relatively small 10-story building, as I described, surrounded on all sides by 20-story buildings, and the sun never hits the top of the roof, and you have a couple hundred square feet of some kind of grass that doesn't need a lot of light, as you described, sir. Does it make sense to mandate that every single building in the city of New York have a green roof or a solar panel? It's one or the other, and there's no option in 276. It's, it's certain new buildings be partially covered in plants or solar panels. It's kind of the way this statute says, doesn't say anything else. Does it make sense? Is there, is there another way that uh, resources, as the gentleman described, can be uh, uh, done by a real property owner that can contribute beneficially to the environment without mandating that he go up there and plant a bunch of plants that are going to need a lot of upkeep, not really be able to do anything, uh, not, you know, not have the sun coming at it, definitely no solar panels because there's not going to be any sun hitting the building. Is there, is it make, does it make sense to have one size fits all rule for those kinds of buildings? So here's the thing. Um, if, if you were headed to a desert island and you could only bring one tool with you and maybe you were dead set thinking at first, oh, a Phillips screwdriver head, or, or would you bring a saw or would you bring, you know, what else is on a Swiss army knife? Um, my tool of choice would be a Swiss Army knife. So if you go through all of the benefits that, it, that a green roof offers, um, is there a better measure that a building owner can undertake to combat one of these issues you see here on the left-hand side if you go on a line-by-line -line basis? Yeah. If you're trying to reduce energy consumption and that's your only goal, then a lighting retrofit would probably be a better bang for your buck with a higher, higher ROI. Is there a more efficient way to grow agriculture up on your roof or, or in the building? Maybe vertical farming, yeah. Or insulate your building or reduce the solar gain. The, the cool roofs program is very effective by that one measure. But no, no technology, no implementation or upgrade to a building is going to get you as many, a wide array of benefits as a green roof does. Um, are we going to potentially come across a building that okay, maybe it doesn't make sense for a green roof. Sure, I, I'm not sure right now what that would be. Maybe an extremely sloped roof with, you know, like a 70 degree, 70 degree pitch or something. Just so people understand, you can build uh, green roofs on sloped rooftops. Uh, we, we do it all the time. Um, so it, it depends on what your goal is. But I think it's definitely worth exploring and looking at the viability across every rooftop in New York City. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Yeah, and I, and I will also add that, that these bills uh, do not only single out green roofs. They, they include solar panels, they include wind turbines. Uh, so the, the bill itself is a Swiss Army knife uh, for developers to decide what works best for their roofs as well, just to keep that in mind. Uh, not 276, Mr. Chair. Oh, 276 have, is sorry, just, not, just look plants or solar it. panels, and that's the, that's the point that I'm trying to make, is that uh, a one-size-fits-all approach uh, just because it's good for the environment does not necessarily make a lot of sense if an enormous amount of resources, money uh, has to be put into a building that doesn't turn back that actual result uh, that we're trying to do, which is to improve the environment, but simply a, a, a gigantic uh, gauze pad for a tiny paper cut. It may not make sense. Well, I, I, I'm sure <laughs> can that we I can add a point look at those well? bills to, to expand them uh, to mirror more of the bill I have, which is which which is that Swiss Army knife of, of choices. Um, can yes. I just add one other point? Um, the other thing is that you have to look at the city as a whole, as a, a system and an environment. And without enough coverage on the rooftops, you're not going to get the environmental impacts that you need. And that could actually lead to more costly um, implications in the future. One of the driving forces for Chicago to implement mandated um, green roofs was because they had to replace their sewer system, which couldn't take the stormwater runoff in the city, which would have been a billions of dollars in infrastructure improvement that they avoided by putting green roofs on a, a certain percentage of buildings in the, in the city. So perhaps you might, might want to set goals of percentage, if that makes more sense than if you feel like a, a a particular mandate wouldn't work. And I would also like to point out that the benefits the green roof offer, they transcend not only environmental benefits, but they tr there's economic and, uh, and social benefits as well. And these benefits as well also uh, serve the private, the building owner, and the occupants, as well as the, the general public at large. One quick word about maintenance. 
Um, generally speaking, we do not use grass on vegetative roofs. Uh, the most common uh, planter uh, species are sedum. And the maintenance on those after the first year of establishment is typically twice a year. So we're not up there mowing the lawn once a week. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, We design them to be like highly tolerant to drought and, um, and low maintenance as possible. Thank you, Councilmember Yeager. Uh, now, I uh, want to acknowledge that we have both Councilmember Menchaca from Brooklyn and Councilmember Ulrich from Queens here. And Councilmember Ulrich has some questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize for uh, being late today, but I did get a chance to review the testimony. I'm a big uh, fan of green roofs and solar energy systems. I think they're great for the environment. Uh, I have a, a few uh, questions and concerns that I hope we can address here uh, with respect to 276. So I, I know more about, admittedly, I know more about solar energy systems than I do green roofs in terms of the financing that's available and also some of the tax credits that are afforded to, uh, uh, you know, private landowners and developers in installing and uh, paying for these systems. Um, I think there's a big gap in um, what we're trying to achieve and how we actually achieve it. For instance, um, the incentives and tax benefits that are available to the owner of a multifamily building, for instance, or a, co a large commercial building, are not available to uh, houses of worship or educational institutions, schools, nonprofits, libraries, because they don't pay property taxes, for instance. They can't write off the depreciation. They may not qualify for the federal tax credit, for instance. And I think we're, we're missing a large swath of city owned or city subsidized buildings, quite frankly, because it doesn't make economic sense for them to do it even when they want to. And we've gone to uh, public libraries and Catholic schools and other places that have large roofs that say, hey, we'd love to have it. We're all for the environment. We want to save money on our energy bills. But it just doesn't make sense for us to package the one-size-fits-all approach that's available to a commercial building owner or a large residential complex is not necessarily available to that uh, institution or to that facility. And I think that's a problem. And I'd love to see if the advocates uh, have any uh, suggestions for how we can mitigate that or incentivize that or, or encourage maybe the state or uh, some of our federal partners to look at that because we're missing, you know, large pieces of property that are just going to fall right through the cracks in the current system. I mean, am, am I correct in that assertion? Can people sort of verify that? Um, for me, unless there's something that's changing. Yeah. You can look to the example of the GSA in Washington, D.C., because that's a huge driver for the green roof implementation that's exploded in that city in the past few years. So um, they have they have mandates and standards through the GSA. So they have a, a toolbox and a performance standard they have to reach. And like Alan said, they choose the green roof as their their tool of, of choice that they, they prefer to, to reach their standards and their um, goals. So look for that model. That's a good one for what you're talking about. I think that the future of, of making this program successful, this initiative successful in New York City, is a public-private partnership. And it requires the carrot and the stick. Having a simple mandate that's unfunded, I think, by the government is a little disingenuous, uh, to be honest with you. I believe that if the government wants to uh, mandate that building owners by a certain year or by a certain date install a, a solar energy system or a green roof or have a percentage of their roof uh, converted or retrofitted that we ought to be paying for it and we don't have to pay for it directly in the financing maybe we allow people to take tax credits off their property tax that they're going to pay to the city anyway over a period of years so that the city's not seeing a hit but we have to provide some financial incentive to the private building owners to do this and to see the benefit of doing this for the environment and also uh, the economic benefit. I don't think we do enough of that now. I think we're, we're just trying to roll out these mandates and require that buildings, uh, new buildings and some of the older buildings meet certain standards, but we're, we're, we're not willing to put our money where our mouth is. The city really needs to do that. And maybe it is a public-private partnership. It's a fund that developers pay into when they get to build higher or bigger and then the city matches it. I don't know. But we have to think of something creative that encourages 
the vast majority of privately owned buildings in this city to be more sustainable and environmentally friendly. And we're not doing that. And I think that these bills have very good intentions and I would love to see all of these things achieved and I love everything that I see up there, but I just don't think it's realistic uh, because it's not going to make economic sense for those people to do it right now. So we have to do more is what I'm saying. I'm not uh, attacking you or, or what, what, what you're trying to do. I'm saying the city of New York and the government as a whole, we are not ponying up what we need to pony up, and we are not encouraging or lighting that fire for the privately owned buildings in the city that produce upwards of 80 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions in the city, right, or 60 some odd percent. Uh, that's, that's the main contributor uh, to, uh, you know, to, you know, carbon in the atmosphere. And, you know, he has a, Raphael has a great bill with the, with the buses and everything, and he's, he's like leading the charge on this with the chair. They're doing everything they can, but that's a drop in the bucket. We know where it's coming from. It's the buildings. But the city doesn't own most of the buildings. They're privately owned. Well, then how do we get the privately owned buildings to, to put green uh, roofs and solar panels? Money, thank you. Somebody said my absolutely money. It costs money and lots of money. These systems are very, very expensive. We know that, and for good reason and they last a long time, but we have to pay for it. We're not, the government is not paying for it. We want them to pay for it, and they're not going to pay for it. We know they're not gonna do it. And if they're not gonna do it, we're not gonna see the, the benefit. That's my... So thank you for the impassioned declaration. I wanted to just submit to the committee that there is a wonderful article written by Danielle Spiegelfeld, who is um, present today, um, that does take a look at exactly what you're, you're suggesting, which is the intentions are good, but what are the real options that we have? And it will require, in order to transform the entirety of the building typology that we have, it will require different tools, carrots and sticks, incentives and rules. Absolutely, we fully support that. So I encourage the committee to take a look at that article um, or to talk directly with Danielle. Also, you know, the policy committee of the Green Roof Re Researchers Alliance would be more than happy um, to reach out. I also, within that article, I think it does discuss, but I'll, I'll make mention, you know, when I think about hospitals, churches, um, for example, Schools. I think about the DEP. Right. Well, I'm actually going to hold these in different because one is held by the city and one is held by the private. Right, yeah. I'm going to think about the Green Infrastructure Grant Program by DEP. I do see opportunities to make improvements to that program, which is very um, well-meaning, but could benefit from some tweaks that might make private property owners more inclined to take advantage of it. And then the thing I would also make mention of is our schools are some of our largest buildings. We also know they're one of our biggest energy consumers appropriately, but that means they're one of the largest greenhouse gas consumers. If we're able to focus on our schools and the school construction authority to overhaul those rooftops, we can have the dual benefits of everything that's on this list and also better educational spaces and potentially outdoor spaces for our children. And so I think that when we think about city-owned buildings, I would encourage us to really take a look at our schools. Absolutely. Yes. If I may, without with with respect to to the the way this these bills interact with other legislation under consideration by this committee and the council, I think it's important that people retain flexibility from the building owner side and the tenant side to be able to make reductions in building emissions through the means that make the most sense for the given building. So we would encourage you to keep this legislation in mind as you think about the other range of packages that you're considering to further, for further force re energy and greenhouse gas reductions on property owners. Not that they're not willing and not already making many of those reforms, but some flexibility is an important way of doing that. And they may want to use their roof for some reason or another to do something else. And it may not make sense to just say solar panel here or green roof, because that money could be better spent perhaps doing something else, lighting, windows, whatever else, insulation, whatever else it might be to make further improvements to the building. So we would encourage that maintaining that kind of flexibility as you think about how this bill interacts with the other range of legislation the council is considering. I, I would love to know if there were any other public-private partnerships in other cities that have worked well and how we can implement those here in New York City, because I don't think that it's fair that they shoulder the entire burden of financing these <coughs> retrofits or these energy upgrades, and I don't think it's fair that the government pays for it entirely, so it has to be a partnership but in New York City, I just don't see that partnership working well because of the fact that 
the vast majority of buildings don't have green roofs and solar panel systems yet, so, solar energy systems. I'd like to share one anecdotally, one, one instance. I see that uh, Dr. Paul Mankiewicz is, is here. He's the president of GIA Institute, a nonprofit. And working with GIA Institute and the Catholic school up in the Bronx, St. Simon Stock, um, we were able to put a green vegetative roof on the school at St. Simon Stock and on a, a part of the church. Uh, we, I, I, I think we're going to, if. Is he you, on the panel? You, you, are, are you scheduled up. to come up at some point? Oh, great. All right, so we'll. we'll I have to stick with this five of you that are up okay, there. Wait, and so we, we did do it. <laughs> with um, some help from the Bronx Economic Development Authority. Yeah, but like I said, the diocese, for, I just use it as an example, they don't pay property tax, they're exempt from a lot of tax requirements that privately owned buildings or commercial buildings currently pay. So for them, they don't have, you know, we can't take that cookie cutter that works for the supermarket building, for instance, and just plop it on <coughs> top of St. Francis Prep High School in Queens, which is huge, you know? So, but I think that we have to come up with, with very creative, uh, packages that address some of these other buildings that have large roofs and also again the government has to set up some sort of uh, fund or some mechanism to allow people to deduct over a certain amount of years from their property taxes we have to give some financial relief and more incentives to privately owned buildings so they can make retrofits and build new buildings that are more energy efficient and sustainable and have green roofs and or solar systems so it's important to understand, again, that many of those benefits of green roofs that have been mentioned today have clear economic benefits to building owners and, and make um, green roofs have an attractive return on investment. But the challenge is overcoming that initial investment. And the upfront cost. The upfront course. cost, sure. Uh, so this graph course. I show here is, okay, it is a, an integrated solar green roof, so you do have a lot of the benefits of the solar in there. But the, the curve basically looks the same for a traditional green roof. And the red there is the initial um, uh, capital investment up front. Um, I'd say two things. One, we need to educate people about these economic benefits so that they understand that a green roof, constructing a green roof is not just some charitable donation that you're right. making to the birds and the bees and the butterflies, but you're actually, it's a selfish investment that you will make a return on Absolutely. that investment. Absolutely. Um, PACE financing, are you are you familiar with PACE I'm not, financing? No, not at all. So it's a property assessed clean energy. And so this has been passed in many states. Um, usually it gets passed statewide. What is PACE again? I'm sorry. We actually have, we have a bill on, okay. on PACE as well. That's But we, we don't have that in New York. Not, not not, not, it's in every county in New York State except New York City for some reason. But it's inevitable, I believe. But base, long story short. That's crazy. No, I know. Long story short, it allows um, investments in clean energy ref retrofits to a building to be uh, fused. Not only two things. One, fused to the property itself, not to the building owner, in that it's paid as a line item on the property taxes. Absolutely. And number two, the payments are spread out right. over a 25 to 35 year long scale. And they're actually designed so that what you pay back each month, let's say, or each year, it's designed to be less than what your net benefits from that installation are. So you remain cash positive the entire time. That's great. I think so, we need that in New York City, and I'm, I'm oh desperately that I'm, will unlock that'll unlock a I'm wave of green the chair. roofs in New York City. The, the other the other the other suggestion that I have is as a city planners and lawmakers, policymakers, we have so many tools at our disposal to incentivize new development to be greener, and uh, we don't provide any funding for developers that come and say, hey, I want this to be a platinum lead you know, certified building. Right. We're not giving any benefit right now. We're very little benefit. The city, um, specifically. I think we absolutely need to look at that. Also, we need to take a look at the zoning laws to say, you know, maybe we give people a bump on the height for uh, 10 feet. Uh, if that we do it now for affordability, right? We, we allow developers that want to build and set aside certain amount of units or percentage for affordable units. Maybe we give a, a bump on the height for people that, that make it uh, elite certified building. I don't know, but we have to provide some real financial practical incentive for these private developers and privately owned buildings to retrofit or build greener. And I don't think that we're doing enough. And a simple mandate, I think, is unfair to them because it lets the city off the hook. 
we're not putting our, our portion of the funds in. And we have a legal and a moral obligation, I think, to lead the charge on this with our own buildings, but also to help the privately owned the buildings in the city, you know, become greener and install these systems on the roof. And we're not doing enough. I, I, I think, again, I think you need to earmark some funds for the structural analysis of these rooftops, because that's a big initial hurdle. That's the first thing every time I hop on a call with someone, I'm interested in the DEP grant, blah, blah, tell me all about it. I'm like, well, I can tell you all about it, but the first thing we need to do is get you through a structural analysis. Well, how much does that cost? Well, that can be anywhere from three to four to ten thousand dollars, depending That's on the size crazy. of the building. The city should be providing it for free if people want it. Uh, if if I owned if I owned all the buildings in the city, I'd want to know what uh, what I was working with because I would want to know where I can develop the rooftops for whatever system and, and where I can't. There is so much we can do, and we're not doing. We as you a can't city. manage what you don't measure. That's right. So uh, I that's my sermon for the day. But I want to thank the uh, the chair. Uh, as always, he's a, a champion for our environment, and he's passing some really important pieces of legislation, and um, he's doing a great job. Uh, he follows in the footsteps of Jim Gennaro, a good friend, and I know he's a mentor of yours. I had the pleasure of serving on this committee when he was the chair almost 10 years ago, and um, I think this is important not as a, as a public servant but as a parent you know, of a six-year-old daughter, that, that she be able to breathe air that's cleaner and drink clean, drink clean water and live in a, in a better environment than even the environment that, that I grew up in or that I'm living in. We have that obligation to give our kids a better, a better city, a greener city, but we have, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. The city of New York, I think, is not doing enough. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Ulrich. Uh, Councilmember Manchaka has some questions. Thank you. Well, and first I want to start with some comments, uh, really kind of maybe indirect to the sermon that was just given by my colleague um, from Queens. And, and I want to offer a different perspective and one, just say thank you for being here. I think it's important that we're having this conversation and the leadership of this chair and this committee is one that we want to get some stuff done. And I think it was mentioned before, we have to figure out how it all works together. But one thing I will not let go is this concept that we have to pay for that from the city itself. I think that there have to be incentives as well. But there's an insane amount of profit being made right now by our developers in our communities. And the fact that they don't want to leave and let go of any of that profit without some kind of matching from the city, I think is not only disingenuous, but I think it's dangerous for us to do. The leadership is in us, this policymakers. And I think we have to go and step forward and say, here's where we need you to go even if it means that it's less profit for you because you're making billions of dollars and we have to then fork over money is just the wrong way to think about this. This is something that is novel, as I understand, but it really isn't. And I think that the, 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 the corporations, the revenues of the world, understand this. They're not dumb. They understand that there's a cash profit, but they don't want to do that initial investment. And I think that's wrong. And I think this is where we need to put policy forward to say, you got to do that. If you want, if you want to, if you want to build in the city of New York, you're going to have to make that investment real. Uh, and so I just, I'm, I'm going to offer my own sermon and say uh, that this is we're in a precipice of change right now in the city, and we have to offer that leadership. And I hope it comes. And for my colleague, uh, a good friend of mine, we we go, we we do a lot of things together. I think what we need to do is 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 commit to that. And I hope that that he and his Republican colleagues can say yes to a BNT conversation, the budget negotiating team, and say, great, if this is a priority, let's make it happen for those who really need it. And for those who don't really need it, and they can dip into their savings slash slush funds of profits, that they make that happen, period. And I think I don't have any questions. Thank you. <laughs> I, so I'd like to just pass one small comment on that. I agree with everything you say, but just to put things in perspective, and I hope I'm not butchering this statistic, but I once read that 90% of the buildings that will exist in New York City in the year 2100 already exist today. So it's important to understand that while new development, yes, absolutely going forward, we should be greening the rooftops. The, the, the bigger fish to fry are the retrofits of existing buildings. No doubt. And I was capturing all that. So I'm glad you clarified that. This is the, the city is constantly in change. And so uh, there's, there's constant uh, investment that's being made with a return that needs to be at a certain point, point or it doesn't happen. Um, that's not New York City. That's not my New York City. That's not our New York City. Thank you for that clarification. Also, can I add on that? Um, I, I know that real estate 
developers have concerns about this, but imagine what the value of real estate will be in New York City when it becomes in, uninhabitable because it's too hot. It's not a pleasant place to be. It's overrun with pollution and asthma attacks. So We're already why? there in so many cases. And again, this is why I, it just it's hard for me to think that this information is not with them right now and, and, and the kind of notion that we have to meet them even halfway with city funding. I just got back, and the reason I was delayed, I was at immigration court with Ravi Rogbier, who just got released, by the way. Uh, I know a lot of you are following him. He's, he got released with his wife. He's going to go back home for another six months before he has another check-in. Um, this is not where we need to be. Um, we need to demand more. Thank you. All right. I that's it, guys. It's a point of personal <laughs> privilege, Mr. Chair. Point, All right, so point, point of personal privilege, just very quickly. No, I, guys, I, I, it's I, not I, I, socialism. The money is not in the wrong hands. Right, okay, guys. this is crazy. We can't force private right, owned right, guys, building guys, guys, owners uh, to uh, do this. All right, please, 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 please. All right, I, I have the mic. Seconds. All right, I will give 30 seconds, but I'm. I will say we ha we have to sort of move on from the sermon. I'll this be afternoon. less than 30 seconds. This okay. won't be a sermon. I just want to point out that none of these bills have uh, an income limit or an income uh, uh, threshold or anything like that. It doesn't talk about whether a building is making untoward profits, whatever that it is that we decide is untoward, or if a building is just barely scraping by. The bill says do this. And the point is that if we're going to incentivize, as my colleague from Queens said, if we're going to ask building owners to do something, we do we should incentivize it because it is a benefit to the entire city. But if a building is just making it, and there are plenty of buildings in the city that are just making it, they're just managing to, to get the garbage out and pay their bills and barely surviving, we shouldn't be throwing a huge burden on them, a financial burden, without some in incentivization from the city. And of course, the large land Landlords and those who can't afford it, they should do a little more, but none of these bills make that differentiation. And I would urge the sponsors to do that, to write pieces into this legislation to make the differentiation between those who can't afford it and those who may need that assistance from the city. And that's my sermon, and I appreciate your indulgence, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Yeager. With that, I, I'm going to thank this, this panel for its time, and I'm going to call the next panel up. <coughs> And, and just to remind everyone, because I know it's been a long time since we've caught a panel, we are sticking to a three-minute clock on, uh, on testimony. Uh, so Marielle Anzalone uh, from the New York uh, Wildflower Week. Uh, Gwen uh, Chance from uh, Brooklyn Grange. Hey, Gwen. Uh, uh, Bavia Reddy from a Hope Program, Sustainable South Bronx. Uh, Michelle uh, Lubke from uh, the Bronx River Alliance, and Jay Welch from the Swim, uh, Julie Welch from the Swim Coalition. Let you right there. All right, so I guess we started on this side last time, so let's start on this time, this side going uh, this, t this time around. <laughs> All right, hold up. I guess they're, they're giving out testimony, both of you guys. All right.
we ready to start the clock? All right, fantastic. All right, go ahead. All right. Sorry for the wait. No worries. Um, good morning, Chairman Constantinidis and members of the committee. I am Pavia Reddy, and I help deliver job training for New Yorkers seeking careers in the green construction field. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the legislative package to make New York City roofs more sustainable. Sustainable South Bronx, a division of the HOPE program, is a workforce development nonprofit that equips New Yorkers facing deep barriers to employment with the tools to achieve economic self-sufficiency. We train community members for careers in the sustainable construction sectors with a special focus on making rooftops more sustainable through green infrastructure, solar panels, and reflective coatings. We support building an equitable New York City through climate change mitigation strategies that are decentralized and community-based. Ensuring that community members who have traditionally been excluded from the positive economic impact of sustainable initiatives can also benefit. According to a report by MIT CoLab, NYC's existing annual investment in green infrastructure on public and private property has been estimated to generate between 262 and 608 job years of entry-level construction employment, jobs that create the opportunity to maximize triple bottom line returns. Between 60% and 80% of NYC's new green infrastructure positions will be entry-level jobs, which could support job creation and long-term employment in the communities where green infrastructure is being built. These are quality jobs with average annual salaries ranging between $33,040 and $63,960. In addition to creating jobs, green roofs mitigate the urban heat island effect, which disproportionately affects the low-income New Yorkers we serve. Green roofs and solar installation generate employment opportunities for community members and local wealth building for small businesses and social enterprises. Unfortunately, market demand for these services does not reflect the urgency of climate change, requiring regulatory interventions like this legislation. However, long after installation, successful implementation of green roofs involves occasional inspections and, in and maintenance. In addition, not all green infrastructure is created equal, and roofs that provide the greatest ecological and aesthetic benefits may require more care. While maintenance is sometimes considered to be a burden, for our graduates and communities, the long-term employment opportunities generated by green infrastructure work can be life-changing. In order to see the greatest benefits, we'd be interested in seeing a focus not just on installation, but also support for building owners for maintenance. Thank you for your support through the Greener NYC initiative and for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much and big fan of the whole program and, and the Sustainable Star Bronx, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Julie Welch and I'm the program manager for Stormwater Infrastructure Matters, SWIM Coalition. SWIM is a diverse group of more than 70 community-based organizations, citywide, regional, and national organizations, water recreation users, institutions of higher education, scientists, citizens, and business owners who advocate for the health of New York City's waterways. Since our founding in 2007, SWIM has advocated for green infrastructure solutions in every borough to capture, filter, and slow the stormwater runoff that can overload New York City's sewer system sometimes even when it rains as little as a tenth of an inch. Green infrastructure or vegetated systems that manage storm water at the source before it reaches our burdened so sewer system is a cost-effective and sustainable approach to water pollution, reducing water pollution and mitigating flooding. Um, according to a recent report by NRDC and NYU Stern's uh, Center for Sustainable Business, stormwater runoff and sewer overflows are the largest ongoing source of water pollution in New York City. Nearly 20 billion gallons of untreated sewage and polluted stormwater flow into our waterways every year. Green infrastructure solutions employed citywide can capture, filter, slow, and ultimately reduce the amount of stormwater that causes the system overflows. Nearly 72% of New York City's land mass is impervious. 
Under a current agreement between the city and the state, New York City has agreed to green 8,000 acres of our 150,000 impervious acres by 2030. Nearly 50% of these 8,000 acres is on private property. That's what we've been discussing today is these incentives that we need to figure out ways to catalyze green infrastructure on private property. Um, to date, the city has greened 467 acres, mostly in the public right of way, with a robust program underway, and we have some time yet to meet the milestones, but uh, we do need to step it up on the private property side. As noted in a recent op-ed in Crane's magazine, which I think someone referenced earlier, the city's rooftops present a unique opportunity for installing multi-purpose vegetated green spaces. We <coughs> thank all of the council members, the forward thinking that you've put into the development of these uh, legislative package and also for the resolution on the green infrastructure tax rebate uh, program. And we commend you for introducing these uh, they will move the city forward. Uh, but before we can support the bills, we need a few more details. Um, we have a few questions that are in this testimony, which I won't necessarily go into right now in order to save some time. We think that um, there are cities, North American cities, whose framework you might look to for as a reference, particularly Toronto and certainly DC, uh, to add to the bills that you have existing now. Um, and we're a little bit concerned about uh, without these adequate incentives for green roof installation that folks are going to go for solar and wind as their options and we want to make sure that we have a network in place with financing and incentives and contractors being well aware of the uh, benefits of green infrastructure and also that we have a system in place for uh, incentivizing the application of this very important aspect of greening our city and preparing for climate change. Currently, green roof adopters in New York City have two avenues for financial assistance. One is the grant program that DEP talked about, and another green infrastructure incentive program that DEP is about to uh, introduce, which is for larger size properties. If and then we you, have the tax. Can get ready to mm -hmm. And then we have the green roof you. tax abatement program. Um, which we would like to work with the City Council on to develop a green roof tax abatement credit transfer program so that nonprofits, particularly those who serve income, low income residents, can take advantage of the, of the plan. So we'd like to make some recommendations there. And then also while DEP is uh, conducting their rate restructuring study, we think it would be good for us to look closely at restructuring the wastewater charge in the, in the water rate bills to more accurately um, account for a, a property's stormwater impact, uh, impact on the stormwater system. Thank you again for the in introduction of these legislative bills. We have attached a table to our testimony which shows the other policies uh, in other North American cities that you might reference. Thank you very much. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Michelle Lupke, and I'm the Director of Environmental Stewardship for the Bronx River Alliance and a member of the SWIM Coalition Steering Committee. Thank you for having this hearing today, and also thank you for allowing us the opportunity to speak on behalf of our community in the following comments. The Bronx River Alliance serves as a coordinated voice for the river and works in harmonious partnership with more than 100 organizations and agencies to protect, restore, and improve the Bronx River as an ecological, recreational, educational, and economic research resource for the communities through which the river flows. Each year through our diverse programming, we engage over 1,500 paddlers, 2,000 students and educators, and thousands of volunteers who come in contact with the river, some for the first time. One of our primary responsibilities is to improve water quality of the Bronx River and are deeply concerned about the impact of fecal contamination from both MS4 systems and CSOs on the river's health and the impact to human health for everyone who uses it as an educational and recreational resource. Along with our colleagues at the SWIM Coalition, we have advocated for green infrastructure solutions to capture, filter, and slow the stormwater runoff that can overload the New York City storm sewer system. Um, we feel that green infrastructure is a cost-effective and sustainable approach to reduce water pollution and that water rate restructuring should be prioritized as an incentive to help encourage property owners to choose green infrastructure solutions. 
In the Bronx River, each year we have over 455 million gallons per year of untreated sanitary sewer and storm sewer going into our river, making it unsafe for our community members to fish, wade, and paddle after heavy storm events, and never safe to swim, which does occur despite our best efforts. GI solutions employed citywide can capture, filter, and slow, and ultimately reduce the amount of stormwater runoff that causes sewer system overflows. However, in the Bronx, we're faced with a high water table and high bedrock levels. So the DEP has not installed the planned green infrastructure as stated in the Bronx River Long-Term Control Plan. Not only have the GI milestones for stormwater management not been met citywide, the DEP does not believe it will be able to fully accomplish mitigating 14% of the one-inch storm events by right-of-way installations in the Bronx River watershed. This means that without support for other stormwater solutions, CSOs will not be attenuated yet our community rate players will still have to shoulder the burdens of the costs associated with the gray infrastructure of the LTCP. Um, so thus we see this, these, this package of bills as being a good incentive uh, da, 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 I'm going to go quickly. Um, in addition to all the salient environmental benefits enumerated herein, the Bronx River Alliance would like to emphasize the need for GI in the Bronx as an economic boon. The Alliance employs a full-time conservation crew made up of hardworking local community members. We hire additional seasonal workers and into an apprenticeship program where they learn skills necessary to enter the green job workforce, including construction, pal plant pallet selection, and maintenance of various GI techniques. However, the green job opportunities we were anticipating following discussions with the DEP regarding anticipated new employees that would be needed in the GI rollout did not materialize. We hope that with this renewed support for green roofs that the awaiting green workforce in the Bronx and beyond will gain employment opportunities. We echo SWIM's concerns and questions and have laid them out in our full testimony. And I appreciate both of your concerns and questions and we will look to at, at those considerations as we move forward so thank you. thank you next hi good morning my name is gwen chance and i am a co-founder and managing partner at brooklyn grange i'm speaking today as a member of the new york city green roofing community to issue strong support for the green roof bills and resolution being discussed today brooklyn grange is a rooftop farming business and we've been using green roofs as the basis for urban agriculture since we opened in 2010. We currently operate three rooftop farms located in Brooklyn and Queens, where we grow nearly 100,000 pounds of organic vegetables each year on a total of about 3.5 acres of green roof. In addition to growing food on green roofs, our farms host thousands of annual visitors, including about 8,000 local public school children each year. Beyond our work as rooftop farm farmers, Brooklyn Grange's design build department also installs green roofs throughout New York City. We're strong proponents of green roofs, and we're eager for the leadership of New York City to take a more active role in incentivizing these installations in the name of improving our local environment and public health. I can't imagine that there's a single person in this room who's opposed to green roofs. We can all agree that they're good for New York. However, I anticipate that there will be opposition to the green roof mandates in this proposed legislation because they might be seen, seen as a burden on developers and the real estate industry which is so important to our city's economy. But my colleagues and I can speak from experience. Green roofs are good for business. As a self-described progressive envir environmentalist, I have an atypically positive relationship with real estate, real estate developers. These businesses have a reputation for paving over mother nature, but as a green roofing contractor, I see real estate developers as my partners in building a greener New York City. If a new building displaces a green space, we can restore it by covering the roof with soil and plants. The same goes for 100-year-old factory buildings, like the ones where my farms are located. It doesn't matter what a building is used for, how tall it is, or where it is. Green roofs can go anywhere and bring environmental benefits to any neighborhood. All it takes is an open roof and a commitment from the people who own and operate the building. Skipping ahead, skipping ahead. <laughs> Three minutes. Um, New York City was once known for its airless tenements, for unbreathable brown air, and for toxic rivers. Building code improvements made in the name of health and safety have changed all of that. And the real estate community has thrived as a, res as a result of, not in spite of, these improvements. I consider myself incredibly lucky, lucky to work closely with nature and also live in New York City. I don't have to choose between green space and business, and neither do any of us. 
Every building has a roof, and green roofs enable us to have both development and green space. Mandatory green roof legislation and stronger green roof incentives will make New York's air cleaner and reduce summer heat waves. It will make our beaches and rivers more swimmable and fishable, and it will help us to show the world that New York is not only the best city there is, but it's also the greenest. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. I've included more information in my testimony specifically regarding each bit of legislation that's being proposed, um, and also a packet that provides examples of what other cities in, in the U.S. are doing in terms of green roof laws. Lucky for us, we do not have to reinvent the wheel. We can just learn from our, our neighbors who have already done this for a decade or more. Thank you. Good afternoon, Committee Chair Constantinides, distinguished members of the committee and guests. My name is Marielle Anzalone. I'm an urban ecologist and the director of New York City Wildflower Week, a nonprofit organization that connects New Yorkers to nature. I thank the members of the committee for this opportunity to testify. I am here to speak in support of the proposed green roof legislation and more broadly, underscoring the immensity of the work that still needs to be done with regarding green as per biodiversity. The United Nations is calling for a new global accord on biological diversity. In 2020, countries from around the world will convene in Beijing to establish new goals for the UN Convention on Biological Diversity. The result will be an international pact to fight the global extinction climate crisis, equivalent to the Paris Climate Accord. Planetary loss of biological diversity is one of the greatest challenges of our times and requires urgent local action. The success of the United Nations Agreement will hinge on the involvement of cities to leverage their resources, innovation, and influence. New York City should lead the fight with an expansive and forward-thinking urban ecological agenda. We need to ensure the resiliency of the city's natural areas by prioritizing native species, combating habitat loss, increasing access to nature in underserved neighborhoods, expanding the ecological economy. In doing so, New York City would set a global benchmark as a leader in resilient, livable cities worldwide. Somewhere in the evolution of cities, it was decided that nature should be beaten back to its edges. Banished to the margin, wildlife is largely peripheral to our urban lives. In New York City, nature is absent by design. Instead of bluebirds outside our windows, we have to seek them out in fields. Instead of violets outside our doors, we have to find them in forests. Why can't we have both? There are myriad ways to weave wildness back into the fabric of our neighborhoods, but such endeavors are not prioritized or funded. If we continue to define cities so narrowly as only hardscapes and humans, nature loses and so do we. If urbanites can't easily get to parks and open space, then these kinds of environments must be brought to them. In the process, urban infrastructure is recontextualized as a civic asset. One avenue toward this goal is green roofs. Rooftops can be transformed through the addition of wildflowers, grasses, and shrubs. Planting native species will provide food for a diverse array of wildlife, pollinators including native bees, butterflies, beetles, and flies, as well as birds that feed on berries and seeds. Research shows that native plants generally support many more insects and birds than non-native species. Installed throughout the city, such green rooms will provide connective stopover habitat. In sum, New York City must make a more active role in recognizing and encouraging the retention of its native biodiversity. In other places around the world, there are already initiatives in place. At a time of global biodiversity awareness, New York City is being left behind. At this time, I'd like to call your attention to the New York Times Magazine from last month. There's an article highlighting the so-called insect Armageddon, the alarming collapse of insect populations around the world. This global devastation of wild insects is also happening here in our city. Legislating the use of native plants on green roofs is a good first step, but there is still much more work that needs to be done. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. I definitely appreciate um, all of your testimonies, and I think this is also an opportunity for us to teach. Uh, you know, by when we install green roofs and solar uh, on our city-owned buildings, especially our schools, uh, I'm a big proponent of us also having panels in those schools to say, here's how much greenhouse gas emissions have been uh, you know, stopped. Here's how much fossil fuels we didn't burn. Here must, here's how much renewable energy has been created or, or, or you know, how we've saved. If we can do that and build it into our curriculum, 
then it's an opportunity for not us to, to fight climate change on the big picture with those installations, but double, triple that by giving our young people an opportunity to learn. And so I definitely agree with you. I know you have a quick comment. Thank you. Um, at the Bronx River Alliance, we incorporate all of our green infrastructure installations into our education program. So we're planting pollinator, native pollinator attracting native plants so that we're providing critical habitat for the populations of pollinators that are collapsing. But then also because the Bronx is a food desert, we need that critical pollinator food source so that they can pollinate any food crops that are being planted. And on one of our parks, we have a food way for people to come and harvest the food sustainably from the park, um, learn about it, learn native cooking um, techniques and, uh, and medicinal uses of native plants. So it is absolutely part of our educational program. So thank you. Yeah. If I may piggyback on that, um, the idea of educating our youth is critical. New York City's natural areas, um, we have lots of schools that are located near natural areas. For example, uh, Seton Falls Park in the Bronx is surrounded by two elementary schools and two high schools, and the kids in those schools never go into the park. So there's a way to tie in um, the, the opportunities for children in New York City to visit natural areas and visit the green roofs that would be on the top of their school and to make those kinds of connections that nature is a continuum. It's not an either or proposition. I agree with you. Thank you so much for your advocacy and your time here today. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you very, very much. Uh, Luger Yancey from uh, Brooklyn NYC, Brooklyn Green Roof LLC. Uh, Marnie uh, Marjorelle, Marjorelle, Alive Structures, Mary Nell Hawk, uh, uh, Self and Allstein Solar LLC, Patrick Weisel, and uh, Marsha Annenberg, Women's Caucus for the Arts. There's still a couple people missing. Anybody else I called? Oh, that's the next panel with the one I just called. Let's see, Luger Yancey? Okay. Marnie? Yeah. Okay. Mary? All right. Patrick Wiesel? Marsha Annenberg? Going once, going twice. All right. <coughs> Yep. All right. Please go. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, so you much. everybody. Um, my name is Marnie Majorell. I'm the founder of Alive Structures. Uh, we are a green roof design and installation company that started in 2007. I really appreciate the conversation that we're having right now, and I've waited a really long time for it. Um, I would be driving around in a Tesla right now if this type of legislation had passed long ago. Unfortunately, green roof industry has had to not flourish the way I had thought it would long ago. And uh, that's a real missed opportunity for the environment, but also for a lot of jobs. Um, I really do want to say that I support a patchwork approach to making um, these bills pass. And I do think that the bills do need real work and um, organizational support and getting feedback from the real estate community. That does not mean watering it down. That does not mean reducing its scope. We need to make practical implementations of these ideas and this legislation. We have to have both a mandate and strong, significant incentives. Um, the easiest mandate to follow through is, uh, you know, new construction, the expense of um, designing a green roof and building a green roof in the design phase is not that high. Um, retrofits are a lot more expensive. So that's the easiest low hanging fruit to make a mandate. However, we are in an environmental emergency, and we are in a crisis, and we cannot lose sight of that. In the inspirational words of Greta Thunberg, the 15-year-old environmental activist, we do not want your hope. We do not want your support. We want your panic, and we want your action. So 
we have to make strong, bold moves right now, even if the real estate market doesn't love every single one of them. However, I do believe to make this work at all, it doesn't matter who pays for it, we need incentives. We need a green building permit, which anyone would love to have a green building permit. Anyone who's dealt with the DOB would say this is a fabulous idea and would jump at the idea of installing a green roof because no one likes spending time at the DOB, obviously. So then we really, really need a property tax abatement, which is on the state level, and Stephen Levin has um, introduced that. Uh, while that's on the state level, you guys have the power to really push that and support it. We need that to happen. Five dollars and twenty-three cents is a joke. Fifteen dollars is great, but we don't. We can't have it for just one year. We need this property tax abatement every single year that that property owner is maintaining the green roof because that property owner is investing the money in cleaning the air and the water of New York City, which honestly I do believe is New York City's job. So that property owner just took that off your plate. So they should not have to pay property taxes for as long as they maintain that green roof. And we need access to free engineering analysis, and we need a reduction on the water bill. And you guys have this all in writing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. The next I, you're up. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I thought you were going in the order you announced them. I'm sorry. No, no, no. You, okay. I'm going from uh, left. Yeah. Hello, my name is Patrick Weisel. I hold a master's degree in landscape architecture from the City College in New York, and I'm employed as a senior project manager with Being Here Landscape Architecture and Environmental Design. I'm here today to express my support, my employer support, and our client, the Nicotra Group, support for Resolution 66 2018 and Introduction 1032 2018. My client, the Nicotra Group, the largest commercial landlord on Staten Island will soon install what I believe is the first urban rooftop farm planned for new construction in New York City. The 30,000 square foot green roof will sit atop Corporate Commons 3, Nicotra's latest Class A office building now under construction on Staten Island's West Shore. Richard and Lois Nicotra are no strangers to environmentally friendly development. They won the Mayor's Zero Waste Challenge Award for reducing the most waste in the entire city they founded the Bloomfield Conservancy to preserve woodlands and wetlands throughout the corporate park of Staten Island, and they're the only developers in New York City to win the Arbor Day Award. <clears throat> Yet they are business people who need to turn a profit. So their initial interest in installing a green roof was not to benefit the environment, but to locally grow fresh produce for their 1,000-seat banquet hall at their Hilton Hotel. But as they began their quest for a freshly picked salad tomato, they didn't know their green roof would engage so many others in Staten Island community and New York City. <clears throat> the city itself was their first green roof partner through DEP's Green Infrastructure Grant Program, in which the Nicotras saw an opportunity for funding to solidify the project, while DEP saw an opportunity to sustainably manage stormwater. The Nicotras then connected with the city's leading expert in rooftop farming, Brooklyn Grange, who will install and manage the rooftop farm. Corporate Commons 3 will become Brooklyn Grange's latest farm. A charter school, Lavelle Preparatory, and a vocational food service school will occupy three of the new building's eight floors. Both see valuable opportunity in having a working farm upstairs to teach children and young adults where food comes from and how to sustainably grow it in an urban environment. Tenants and workers throughout Corporate Commons will have an opportunity to rent a green roof event space or purchase fresh produce to take home for better nutrition. So, an idea that began as a fresh tomato and a bride salad also became a city's stormwater management tool, an urban farmer's field, a school's educational opportunity, an event space, a farmer's market, and who knows what more as the green roof grows in the community's imagination. You will surely hear today about the many important environmental benefits of green roofs. We also want to underscore their ability to grow and benefit communities. We can only hope this new legislation will create many more community building green roofs throughout New York City, like Corporate Commons 3. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Next up. Hi. Um, my name is Inger Yancey. Um, I have a, I'm an architect in New York. Press the mic to, to make sure you're. Hello? Yeah. Okay. We hear you. Uh, hi. My name is Inger Yancey. Uh, I founded my company, Brooklyn Green Roof, 2000, 
and eight when the green roof tax abatement was first instituted. I am originally an architect um, registered in the state of New York, have also had to become a contractor registered in the city of New York uh, in order to do this work. Um, I stepped up because I felt that this was the best use of my personal skills in order to find a good way to help combat climate change. Um, I am really, really happy today to see um, all of this energy and effort being put forward to support green roofs, solar in our city, and uh, you know, it's hopefully, maybe, finally, we will actually be able to make a living <laughs> doing this kind of work. Um, there are a lot of green jobs, as people who've come before me have said, that will be supported. Um, and I firmly believe that it is time to act on climate change in every way, in every space, in every place, by every person. Um, and that the only way that New York City can really step up to the plate is they need to incentivize everyone to try to be able to be to live their lives in a greener way. So um, they these bills, I think, help in a substantial way to allow people to step up to the plate and be responsible. I would also say um, I know that there are a lot of people who are worried about the financial implications and the structural implications and all of this, but. Um, as an architect, I can definitely say that, and as, as someone who's been working in this field for 10 years, um, the buildings in this city are strong enough to put green roofs on them. They need to have a fresh waterproofing layer so that you make sure they don't leak. They do need to be um, assessed, and I would definitely recommend um, adding new legislation that uh, helps building owners in getting their properties assess structural assessment on the roof. But um, <laughs> there's just a tremendous potential in this city for green roofs to improve the environment in every way, and I support them. Thank you. Hi. My name's Mary Nell Hawk. I started a company recently called Allstein Solar LLC. We're a family-owned consultancy. We've had one success in Queens, solarizing a, a building. And I got into this because I was a lot of um, tiredness about going to demonstrations and things like that. And... Uh, <laughs> It has been an incredibly um, hard journey, but this um, flat top roof in Queens with two families and three stories plus a basement is now after like four years um, um, generating 7.5 kilowatts of power, uh, and not sort of enough for the building, but uh, some of the relatives are like, you know, oh, it's cheaper, we'll use more. You know, we're trying to get through that uh, idea. Um, so, but with my time, I guess, I wanted to think one thing I might contribute to this um, bill's 0141 and 0276, and most people already know it, and people would dispute it, but our engineers said that the building was not good for a green roof because it was not strong enough. Um, so we went to solar after that, and I, I think that it might help the text of these things because working with DOB and stuff is really hard. Um, just to have something that says that green roofs may take more stronger roofs than solar. The solar is working really great. Um, and I lastly just want to ask everybody in this room to look for a way to be involved in solar. I would love a show of hands. Who has gone through the process of actually um, doing a solar? from getting the roof um, looked at, which as you know is expensive, to in, um, getting Con Ed and going um, 
generating energy for, say, six months. Could I please have a show of hands? <laughs> I have my hands up. Okay. I challenge you, look for, look for a place that you can get involved in. And with ours, our family that lived in the building was not um, rich enough to do this, but my husband and I that don't live there did. We actually started an LLC, leased the roof from the relatives, and now we're billing them for their electricity. So there's all kinds of ways to do this on a small scale. Um, for small buildings, and I think that's really one of the huge answers. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, definitely appreciate all of your testimonies, and uh, I, I think uh, I agree with you that we have to get the tax abatement right, mm -hmm. um, and I think that we, as New York City, we need more control of our ability to do our tax abatements without having to go hat in hand to Albany every time we want to do something like this. So I'm hoping with the new paradigm in Albany, that we can actually be able to give those incentives more freely as a city and not have to constantly ask them for permission to do so. Uh, and so looking forward to seeing what that Democratic State Senate, let's, you know, we can take that out for a ride and see how, you know, how it goes. <laughs> Thank you very much for your testimony and your advocacy. Thank you. All right, last panel, uh, Paul Mankiewicz. Uh, Aziz uh, Daral, uh, Misty Gonzalez, Willis Elkins, Chris Rice, and Lucia Pullman. I have it, but I'll send it. I guess we'll, uh, we started on this side last time, so let's start on this side this time. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Misty Gonzalez, and I am the founder and creative director of Hoarders Environmental Design, <clears throat> and I'm also a landscape specialist and specifications consultant with Robert Schwartz and Associates. Um, where do I start? So what I would like to say is that in addition to uh, the wonderful advocates who have gone before us and their comments on um, adding employment and also opportunities for um, heat island management as well as uh, water management. You know, I didn't think I was going to be this nervous when I got up here because I was just <laughs> fine. <right>? So, <laughs> Nothing to be worried. Yeah. You're doing great. You're doing right. fantastic. Nothing uh, to be nervous about. Right. At any rate, what I, would, what I would like everyone to consider in addition to what we've already heard is that nature has a much further reaching effect on us than we realize. And there are scientifically based studies that prove that uh, green spaces are vital to residents in urban communities. And what that means for all of us is that then we go outside and we interact and we take better care of our environments and one another. And that means that the cohesion of the community is the success of the community as a whole. And in addition to that, if we look at that from a standpoint of a company, because I know that we have to marry these two. There's one that's very idealistic, and there's another point of view that's very financial. And there has to be some meeting in the middle with these. And what I would submit to you that if you look at any company, if you look at the state of the employees, you know the state of the company. And so if we look at the state of our residents in New York City, if we look at the state of our residents, we know the state of our city. And I feel it's very important that we look at that from, from that point of view. Um, something that was also important that was brought up before is that we're in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. And what that means is that it's an all-hands-on-deck moment. It's not a time for any of us to sit and contemplate. It's a time for all of us to act. Um, 
And I, I do believe that there are trifectas in terms of architecture being good for people, being good for finance, and being good for the environment. And I believe that that is a, a, a possible and an attainable goal that is actually executable. Um, and in conclusion, I would just say that New York City is really a model for art. We're a model for music. We're a model for culture and sophistication. And I really believe that it behooves us to get on this train and be a model for sustainable living and better societies. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. Go ahead, next. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Willis Elkins. I'm the executive director of the Newtown Creek Alliance. And uh, I want to speak a little bit specifically about uh, some of the direct impacts. We've talked a lot about stormwater management, but what it really means uh, to me and my community and uh, our constituents. So Newtown Creek, as many of you know, super fun waterway, borders uh, Queens and Brooklyn. We have severe historical contamination there as well, but we also suffer tremendously from combined sewer overflow. Uh, every year our waterway, uh, which is a small, narrow uh, area, only four miles long, receives over well over a billion gallons of combined sewage every single year. And we, as, as we know, this is caused by um, the way that our sewer system is designed and rainwater, as little as sometimes a tenth of an inch of a rain, uh, can overwhelm our treatment plants and cause this untreated sewage to go into the waterway. The result of that, of course, is places like Newtown Creek, uh, Flushing Creek, Bronx River, Gowanus Canal, uh, all these vital community areas or could be, uh, you know, more resources for the community um, are failing to meet Clean Water Act standards that were set over 40 years ago. Um, it's unsafe for, for human contact and uh, it proposed, you know, poses tremendous threat to the wildlife uh, that is in the waterway and struggling to exist there. So uh, part of the solution that the city has put forward as the long-term control plan for the creek is to build a massive underground storage tunnel uh, to capture CSO when it rains. Uh, it's something that generally we're supportive of, uh, but it's an incredibly expensive, a billion dollar project, and it's gonna take 25 years to complete. Uh, the city has also been pursuing their green infrastructure program uh, focused primarily on these right-of-way uh, rain gardens or bioswales. Uh, the city's installed uh, thousands of these throughout the city. Um, it's something that we're very supportive of, but there are severe limitations as to how much stormwater we can absorb with the, with the rain gardens. And that's things like we heard about in the Bronx with uh, geological considerations. There's things about where you can actually place them, uh, soil contamination like we have in Greenpoint and other places around the creek. So there's real limitations. And the most obvious place to be collecting stormwater uh, is, is in addition to the streets and sidewalks is on top of our buildings. And it's really, as we heard before, the less than 0.1% of our rooftops actually capturing stormwater uh, is a real travesty and needs to be changed. And it's the real uh, obvious, the most obvious solution uh, to preventing uh, combined sewer overflow. Citywide, we heard earlier, again, the stat, over 20 billion gallons of untreated sewage every, storm, every year entering New York Harbor. It's, it's, it's kind of insane that we're this far past the Clean Water Act, and yet we still have our waterways that are, that are unfit for human uh, contact. So um, I really just want to emphasize that point. There are direct impacts of stormwater. It's not just something we can talk about in vanity. I spend uh, dozens and dozens of days out on the waterway dealing with the direct impacts, measuring water quality uh, and things like that. And frankly, we need to see real action now and not wait 25 years. Uh, the other part I would add is just that uh, I am fortunate to be part of the 0.01% that works in a building that has a green roof on top. It's an amazing community resource, Kingsland Wildflowers. We bring school groups up there, community members use it as open space, and it's a wonderful asset and provides all these additional benefits for habitat, nature, connection to nature, and all that. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And I, I, if, if you come out to Queens, we've got the, uh, the, the CSO next to the Howitz at Howitz Cove that abuts public housing. Um, we also have uh, the Bowery Bay CSO that abuts the Elm Jack Little League. So on a, a, a day after it's rained, it, you know, my son calls it a rotten egg river because <laughs> the, the smell there can not knocks the, the parents and the kids off their feet. Steinway Creek. Steinway, yeah. yeah. yeah there, there's, we can go on and on and on. So I, I appreciate the, the efforts and the work that you guys are doing in, in Newtown Creek. <laughs> go ahead. Hi, my name is Lucia Pullman. Thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm speaking as a resident 
of New York. I just moved here actually from the Bay Area where I was working in urban ag and green infrastructure type projects. And I'd like to say that first off, in California and in the West, we do not have the built environment to withstand snow and to compare the West and the type of buildings that are built there and to look at the West as an equivalent is not true. New York City's buildings are meant to sustain greater weight in the winter and thus you're at a huge comparative advantage to be able to be doing this kind of work. And so it's kind of frustrating to hear you guys compare those things when you're really at a big advantage. So I think in your conceptual framework around how we're doing in New York City, I think you should realize the comparative advantage that you guys have in your built environment. Secondly, um, I think that one of the big learnings I had listening to testimony was the co-benefits of putting solar and green infrastructure on roofs together in that they double or a 15 to 25 percent increase in the efficiency of solar panels. That's a huge win, and I think that there should be recognition of that in whatever legislation that you do provide. If you use two of the sustainable roof methodologies on a single roof, that you should be reaping additional benefits for that kind of work instead of it being the same kind of incentive. Um, and the third, I'd like to point out a New York City Housing Authority program called Access Solar, which enables community nonprofits and other small businesses to rent NYCHA roofs at no cost or low cost to implement solar projects. I think that that kind of model can open up a lot of New York City's rooftops for um, like more creative owners of those solar and green roof projects. It doesn't have to be the property owner that's investing and maintaining those kind of works. There's a lot of need within the community for green space and for cheaper renewable energy. And those smaller businesses and nonprofits can invest in opening up private rooftops that otherwise wouldn't be invested in. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Sir, next up. Hi. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Paul Mankiewicz, I am the founding board member of the New York City Soil and Water Conservation District. I run something called the Guy Institute. I have a business called Gaia Technologies. We put in green infrastructure, uh, and I've worked on, on this for a long while in New York City. Uh, this is a great framework. The problem with it, it will, it's, bound to, it's guaranteeing its own failure now because there's no water in it, because plants without water are black body radiators. So you can take a heat gun like this and point it at grass or at sedum, and it will, on a, hundred and, on a 95 degree day, it'll be uh, 102, 104, same, it's all the same. And I, I brought a paper by Cynthia Rosenzweig, it says the same thing. So basically, but the other side of it is, there's also a plus plus, basically a multiple benefit, which is basically, we have, give me 600 million gallons a day of gray water in New York City, besides the storm water. That is worth, about six times our peak load requirement. I'm doing that valuation because every 33 gallons of water you have apotranspire from a green roof is basically worth a ton of air conditioning, basically worth something like 20-ish bucks. So uh, the point is the $6 we pay for each 100 cubic feet of water is worth $400 in cooling capacity. And I don't have one in Queens, but if you come to um, uh, the Linda Tool Corporation uh, in, uh, in Brooklyn, he saves 40% of his air conditioning and 24% of his heating. But plants are not plants are not plants. Without water, they're black body radiators. And basically the framework that is now in front of everyone uh, is that we are basically, you, so you walk into Central Park when it's, if it's dry a bunch of days, and those, it's going to be warm because it's actually we know it from sweating so uh, it's also uh, the the other way to say this is 16 grams of water are worth about a gram of Iraqi oil where do you want to get it and what do you want to do with it because the energy is energy is energy is energy so um, that's um, that's not all I have to say it just I, I think you can entirely change this framework but it's the, the transformative force on the planet is water you, uh, you can't do it with something small. You have to get multi-layers. If you put some spec, some specification on green roofs for water holding and basically being moist, conserving water is great. It's just water is, uh, as Cynthia Rosenzweig and others have shown, you walk into Central Park on a, on a, on a hot day and it'll be cooler. Uh, if it's rained recently, much, much, much cooler. So I would love to see that because this is certainly the right track. Great. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'd like to thank the City Council for having this hearing. It's uh, long overdue. As an introduction, my name is Chris Rice. I am a manufacturer's representative to American Hydrotech in the New York City Territory. I've been with roofing and waterproofing and green roofs for over 25 years. So basically my discussion is to talk about green and the cost. That's the bottom line to own a developer. Green is great. We're all in this room. We all could agree it is great for the infrastructure and for the environment. But bottom line here is what is the cost. Uh, getting to the gentleman, Mr. Yeager, there, talking about the buildings surrounded by other buildings having green. There are other methods of doing a good blue roof, green roof design there for stormwater management, which is really big here in New York City, thanks to a nice DEP grant uh, that offers $30 a square foot. But unfortunately, it's not marketed to the owner developer. They don't know about this. This is low-lying fruit that could be used by any owner or developer in private or in retrofits. So as for your school there at PS2 uh, in Queens, which is a paver <coughs> assembly, you could replace those pavers with a green tray holding the insulation down and still get a, a grant involved in that if you can. $30 is substantial. When you use a green tray, which weighs about 25 pounds, saturated wet, that could be in lieu of a paver that's sitting on top of insulation. That green tray, on average, is about $15 a square foot. That qualifies for a $30 grant. That offsets the cost of material and possibly insulation, whether it's a union or non-union job. So in terms of green infrastructure, this has to be done. And if you don't know, Storm Sandy was the big wake-up call. It's managing water in our city. If you have a quarter inch of rain, it goes through our sewer system, which is well over 100 years old. If you break one of those sewer pipes, it's going to cost you millions of dollars to repair it. We have to slow the migration of water down. By having green and solar and all the wonderful things on top, that's a great benefit to ownership. But you have to show the owner developer where the money's at so they can put it back in. If you do a blue roof in new construction, you have a stormwater retention tank that's below grade, costing hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions. If you do a blue roof using all those concrete platforms that they're building already to put waterproofing on that, that could be taken out, saving owners cost, big, major costs on that by doing a blue roof on that. So there are a lot of great stuff. You should get involved, owner and developers. I don't think there are any here. You should have them involved and hear their input. You should also have waterproofing manufacturers that have all this research and information on that because when you do a blue roof or a garden roof, you want to make sure that building's watertight, does not leak. And manufacturers can offer warranties for 30 years of labor material covering everything on that roof, from the green to the insulation for R value and the waterproofing done by an applicator. And again, I represent a manufacturer that's an open design. It's not proprietary. And as being a New York citizen for all my life and paying taxes, this is the best thing you could do for the city of New York. Follow everything else. Follow Chicago. Follow European markets. They're doing it. Why are we so slow? Right? If you have to find revenue, it's like if we're being charged our water bill. You're now going to have to charge the owner developer a tax if they don't have stormwater management on their concrete platforms. I thank you. My name is Chris Rice. I, I thank you all for your, your testimony here today and your advocacy and your patience. I know that's been a couple of hours since this hearings began, so I appreciate you staying here for the entire uh, uh, hearing and giving your good testimony. So thank you. Um, so with that, um, I will say that we are uh, grateful to the administration. It looks like we are there in support of these bills. We're looking forward to seeing them passed very soon. I want to thank all the advocates and all of those who gave testimony today uh, to make this we need you know to make this possible. Uh, we need to make New York City greener and more sustainable, and green roofs, solar, wind will help us get there. Uh, so I look forward to working with all of you um, to make New York City the place that we need it to be uh, to combat climate change. I want to thank my colleagues who are here and members of the committee. I want to thank our staff attorney and uh, great leader in her own right, Samara Swanston. Thank you, Samara. Uh, and of course, uh, Nadia Johnson, our policy analyst, and now our new policy analyst, Ricky, as well. Welcome. And our financial analyst, uh, Jonathan Seltzer, who I think was here before. And of course, my attorney and legislative director, uh, Nick Wazowski. And to the sergeants at arms, uh, thank you for making this such a seamless uh, hearing as always. Uh, with that, I'll gavel this hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee closed. <laughs>